Back now to Kenosha, where the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse is officially underway. Prosecutors say the Rittenhouse, then 17 years old, shot three people, killing two of them during the riots in the streets of Kenosha back in August of 2020. Monday was all about jury selection, as both sides quizzed more than 150 candidates, who will then be whittled down to 20 jurors. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek joins us live now from the Kenosha County Courthouse. And Andrew, a number of potential jurors have already been released there. Yeah, Jason, 29 potential jurors have already been released from consideration for sitting on this jury. That's because of their questions from the judge, the prosecuting attorneys, and Kyle Rittenhouse's defense attorneys. It's a long process to find a 20-person fair and uh, unbiased jury. Dressed in a gray suit, Kyle Rittenhouse entered the courtroom in Kenosha Monday morning just before 9.30. As Judge Bruce Schrader, prosecutors and Rittenhouse's defense attorneys worked to find 20 impartial jurors to be seated for his criminal trial. The voir dire is an examination of people to determine if they can, are suitable to serve on a jury. The court called in 150 potential jurors to be questioned. They called that many for several reasons. The first being that the case has seen national and even international attention, and a lot of people have likely heard about what happened on August 25th, 2020. They also need to seat 20 jurors for this trial. And you hear on television sometimes they'll talk about alternate jurors. We don't have any alternates. Everybody who is picked is a full-fledged juror. The selection process takes place at the end. Before lunch, nearly 20 jurors were dismissed. Some of them were let go because of scheduling conflicts, as the trial is expected to last up to two weeks. I'm going to ask about two weeks plus two days. A majority of jurors who were dismissed were let go because of what they said was their inability to set their personal biases aside. That included one who said his political beliefs on the Second Amendment couldn't be set aside, despite the judge asking it to be. The, the, the Second Amendment, like all the constitutional provisions, have a role in this case but they are not the focus of this case, okay? Schrader also urged the potential jurors to follow the rules. The biggest one is to not discuss the case with anyone. They aren't sequestered. He said there's a less than 1% chance of that happening. One juror said she'd have a hard time not telling her sister. Before releasing her, the judge said he could sequester individual jurors if needed. I, I don't think it's beyond you to obey the rule. Okay, I'll, I'll try. Now, Jason, the judge and the attorneys in this case are talking to a 34-person panel and asking them questions, and both sides have had a chance to question and cross-examine those potential jurors. They will each have seven strikes each to strike a total of 14 potential jurors to get down to their 20-person panel. Andrew, quickly, and you touched on this, there is so much attention on this trial from folks all across the country right now. Do you believe that those in the courtroom, from the judge to the attorneys to those potential jurors, are they aware of that? Were there any indications about that today? Jason, we actually heard some of that uh, from some of the potential jurors who were being questioned just about an hour ago, some of their concerns that they have city, sitting not on a jury itself, but specifically on this jury. Some of them are kind of worried about maybe some retaliation or things that could happen to them outside of the courtroom, despite uh, or kind of whichever way the um, eventual verdicts in this case will go. So there was some concerns about that. The judge tried to quash some of those concerns, saying that he will go over some of those safety protocols that will be in place for those jurors once that jury is seated. A lot to watch and be aware of in the days ahead, and we're fortunate to have you there. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek, live from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew, thank you for joining us. Back now to Kenosha, where the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse got underway Monday and some late-breaking developments Monday evening. Prosecutors say the Rittenhouse, then 17 years old, shot three people, killing two of them during riots in the streets of Kenosha back in August of 2020. Monday was all about jury selection as both sides were quizzing more than 150 candidates in all who were then whittled down to 20 jurors late Monday. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek begins our team coverage. 11 women and 9 men make up the jury of 20, which will decide the fate of Kyle Rittenhouse. Jury selection started at 9.30 Monday morning and lasted nearly 10 hours. Dressed in a gray suit, Kyle Rittenhouse entered the courtroom in Kenosha Monday morning just before 9.30. As Judge Bruce Schrader, prosecutors and Rittenhouse's defense attorneys worked to find 20 impartial jurors to be seated for his criminal trial. The voir dire is an examination of people to determine if they can, are suitable to serve on a jury. 
The court called in 150 potential jurors to be questioned. They called that many for several reasons. The first being that the case has seen national and even international attention, and a lot of people have likely heard about what happened on August 25th, 2020. They also need to seat 20 jurors for this trial. And you hear on television sometimes they'll talk about alternate jurors. We don't have any alternates. Everybody who is picked is a full-fledged juror. The selection process takes place at the end. Before lunch, nearly 20 jurors were dismissed. Some of them were let go because of scheduling conflicts, as the trial is expected to last up to two weeks. I'm going to ask about two weeks plus two days. A majority of jurors who were dismissed were let go because of what they said was their inability to set their personal biases aside. That included one who said his political beliefs on the Second Amendment couldn't be set aside, despite the judge asking it to be. The, the, the Second Amendment, like all the constitutional provisions, have a role in this case, but they are not the focus of this case, okay? Schrader also urged the potential jurors to follow the rules. The biggest one is to not discuss the case with anyone. They aren't sequestered. He said there's a less than 1% chance of that happening. One juror said she'd have a hard time not telling her sister. Before releasing her, the judge said he could sequester individual jurors if needed. I, I don't think it's beyond you to obey the rule. Opening statements in the case will start Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. Opening statements begin this morning in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek has details on who makes up the 20-person jury. On Monday, a 20-person jury made up of 11 women and 9 men was seated in the case against Kyle Rittenhouse. There is only one person of color on the jury. The court called in 150 potential jurors to be questioned and worked 34 people at a time to get to the final 20 jurors. There was one black woman who was part of the panel for a majority of the day, but she was struck after having an individual one-on-one -on -one with the judge and lawyers on the case. Judge Bruce Schrader is urging the jury to not talk about the case and not to watch, listen, or read anything about the trial. We all have to live life with its limitations and, and resist some of our impulses, and I, I don't think it's beyond you to obey the rule. Opening statements start just after court resumes for the day at 9 o'clock this morning. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. The jury in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial spent the morning listening to opening statements. Eleven women and nine men were sworn to the jury last night. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Hevranek has the latest from Kenosha. The state and defense each presented their case to the jury, introducing them to key players in this case and explaining events on what they believe happened the night that Kyle Rittenhouse shot three people, killing two on August 25th, 2020 here in Kenosha. The prosecution argued that despite the hostile environment during the Jacob Blake protests, no one shot and killed anyone except for Kyle Rittenhouse. The defense argued there's a reason why. Mr. Binger makes a big thing out of Kyle Rittenhouse was the only person who shot somebody that evening. True. Mr. Rittenhouse was the only person who was chased by Joseph Rosenbaum that evening. We're not asking you to solve a mystery in this case. In most homicide cases, the elements that I need to prove might be a little challenging, but here, there's no doubt there will be no dispute in this record that the defendant had that gun that night, shot eight bullets, four of them hit Joseph Rosenbaum, two of them at an unknown individual, one into Anthony Huber's chest, and one into Gage Grosskreutz's arm. That will not be in dispute. The jury is starting to hear from witnesses in this case, including Dominic Black. Black was dating Rittenhouse's sister and is the one who bought Rittenhouse the gun that was used in those shootings last August. Rittenhouse will also testify in his case. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. And live on Spectrum News 1, back to Kenosha. Testimony continues right now as the jury in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial has heard their first few witness testimonies on Tuesday after both sides gave their opening statements on Tuesday morning. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek joining us back live from the Kenosha courthouse there. Andrew, who did the state, the prosecutors, call to testify? 
Jason, the state called Dominic Black to the stand as their first witness in this case. Now, he is the person who bought Kyle Rittenhouse, that AR-15 that was used last August. He was their first witness on the stand after each side presented their opening statements. During its opening statement, the prosecution against Kyle Rittenhouse told the jury this isn't a whodunit kind of trial. We're not asking you to solve a mystery in this case. In most homicide cases, the elements that I need to prove might be a little challenging, but here, there's no doubt, there will be no dispute in this record that the defendant had that gun that night, shot eight bullets, four of them hit Joseph Rosenbaum, two of them at an unknown individual, one into Anthony Huber's chest, and one into Gage Grosskreutz's arm. That will not be in dispute. Assistant District Attorney Thomas Binger stressed that Rittenhouse was the only person to shoot and kill another person during the nights of unrest in Kenosha after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. His defense said there's a reason why. Mr. Binger makes a big thing out of Kyle Rittenhouse was the only person who shot somebody that evening. True. Mr. Rittenhouse was the only person who was chased by Joseph Rosenbaum that evening. The state first called on Dominic Black to help prove their case. Black was dating Rittenhouse's sister and bought an AR-15 for Rittenhouse while they were heading to family property in Ladysmith, Wisconsin. He did not, or I did not have the money for it, so he said he would pay for it. Um, I told him that wasn't a good idea. He wasn't 18, but uh, we came to an agreement to where he could have it once he is 18. Black bought the gun and registered it in his name. After a weekend of shooting targets and clay pigeons in May 2020, the gun stayed in a safe at Black's stepdad's house. The night of the protests, the gun was inside the house because Black said his dad brought them inside. He walks out of the house with an AR-15 and you don't say boo, correct? I didn't say anything, correct. And you have the ability to speak? Yes. If you wanted to object, you could have said something to Kyle, correct? Yes, I could have. And you didn't? No. Because you wanted him to have the gun for protection. Black and Rittenhouse met up with a third friend, Nick Smith. They planned to protect car source locations that had been vandalized and burned the night before. One of us had received information that one of the car source dealerships was being vandalized or Try, people are trying to burn it down. Black said he saw Rittenhouse heading in that direction, and then not long after, he heard gunshots. He didn't know immediately that Rittenhouse was the one involved until Rittenhouse called him. I answered it, and he just said, I shot somebody, I shot somebody, and then hung up right away. When they finally met up, Rittenhouse had shot and killed Joseph Rosenbaum, Anthony Huber, and wounded Gage Grosskreutz. He was freaking out. He was really scared. He was pale, sweating a lot. Um... You could tell he was just scared. Black said he told Rittenhouse they had to go and turn him in, but didn't do so in Kenosha because of the protests. So they drove back to Antioch. There, Black said Rittenhouse's mom suggested Kyle go on the run and go to family property where Black believed was in Michigan or West Virginia. Said no, he should turn himself in. Rittenhouse turned himself into police in Antioch after 1 o'clock in the morning. Now, of note, Dominic Black also faces felony charges for supplying Rittenhouse with that AR-15. Andrew, quickly, the jury also heard testimony from an FBI agent on Tuesday afternoon. Any word on what they're hoping to show the jury there? Jason, that FBI agent is not allowed to be seen on camera or uh, to be heard through the live feed that we're receiving down here in the media workroom. But what we do know from reporters inside the courtroom is that that FBI agent was actually in a plane and had taken some infrared uh, video of the scene that night. Um, the prosecution is hoping that that video shows that Rittenhouse was chasing Joseph Rosenbaum, not the other way around, to work in the defense's uh, case, saying that this was all an act of self-defense. That FBI agent has not finished testimony. They're having some issues with some of the videos that they're having there, so they moved over to another uh, witness in this case, Jason. Plenty to watch play on the days ahead. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Hovranek back live in Kenosha for us tonight. Andrew, thank you for joining us here. This morning, the jury in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial could hear more from an FBI agent who began testimony Tuesday but didn't finish 
During opening statements, prosecutors said they expect to call members of Jason Rosenbaum's family. That could also happen today. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Hivrenik has more on what we can expect from day three and what has happened so far. Jurors have heard testimony so far from three witnesses in this case. Most recently, Corey Washington, a local social media influencer who was live streaming the protests back in August 2020. His testimony will continue later on this morning. Jurors also already heard from an FBI agent who was in an airplane that night filming on an infrared camera. The prosecution hopes that that video shows that Rittenhouse was chasing Rosenbaum, not the other way around before Rosenbaum was fatally shot. They also heard from Dominic Black, the man who bought Rittenhouse that gun. He walks out of the house with an AR-15 and you don't say boo, correct? I didn't say anything, correct. And you have the ability to speak? Yes. If you wanted to object, you could have said something to Kyle, correct? Yes, I could have. And you didn't? No. Because you wanted him to have the gun for protection? Again, court will resume at 9 o'clock with testimony from Corey Washington. In Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. The jury saw the moments that Kyle Rittenhouse shot and killed Joseph Rosenbaum, Anthony Huber, and injured Gage Grosskreutz. The lead detective in the case also testified and explained to the jurors what exactly they were seeing in those videos. Graphic video was presented to the jury in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial Wednesday as the lead detective in the criminal case laid out the timeline of events that happened on August 25, 2020. He analyzed video, including the one you're seeing here, where Rittenhouse fires four shots at Joseph Rosenbaum. In a stopwatch, I estimated that time to be approximately two and a half seconds. The jury saw several videos from different people who were recording and live streaming protests and shootings involving Rittenhouse that night. Kyle Rittenhouse watched those videos as well from the courtroom. He didn't show much outward emotion, but when Rosenbaum was seen on camera gasping for air, Rittenhouse looked away. One video caused about an hour delay Tuesday afternoon. It was a video from an organization called The Rundown Live. The defense objected to audio being used because the person narrating was not subpoenaed. I did not stipulate to the editorial comments. I have no objection. Obviously, there's no basis for it. When they want to play statements of my client that are on video, that's, that's not hearsay. But this and his statements regarding militia, things like that, that is your saying. Prosecutors disagreed, and the judge sent the jury away while they argued and then took a break. They did agree that sound from Rittenhouse's interviews and police offering water bottles to Rittenhouse could be used. We appreciate you guys, we really do. Earlier in the morning, the jury finished hearing testimony from Corey Washington, a local social media influencer who was also live streaming. He had captured video of Rittenhouse running past the ultimate gas station with a fire extinguisher. Kind of looked young to me, and he had his gloves on and he was smoking cigarettes and stuff. So I was, I don't know, I kind of was like, uh, he kind of seemed like an interesting figure. So I just took a mental note of that. It wasn't anything, I wouldn't say malicious. I just, you know, a young person in a situation. During cross-examination, Washington got visibly frustrated with some of the defense's questioning. He testified that he made a mental note of Rittenhouse earlier in the night and the defense pushed to know why. Suppose it could have been anyone that ran by me. I would have been intrigued by it, but remembering kind of, you know, in my head. And he had a fire extinguisher as well, so maybe there's a fire or something happening. Maybe he's going to extinguish a fire or something like that. Washington said when he followed Rittenhouse toward car source and witnessed the shootings, he did not see a fire there. Court will resume on Thursday with the cross-examination of that lead detective on this case. Now, right as court was ending for the day on Wednesday, one of the prosecuting attorneys said there was an issue with one of the jurors. The prosecutor said one of the jurors had made a joke. It's not clear what exactly the nature of that joke was, but the judge said he would take that up on Thursday. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. 
Yesterday, jurors watched video that showed Kyle Rittenhouse shooting and killing Joseph Rosenbaum, Anthony Huber, and injuring Gage Grosskreutz. Detective Martin Howard with the Kenosha Police Department explained what jurors were seeing in those videos. He told jurors Rittenhouse shot eight times that night, four at Rosenbaum, twice at an unidentified person, once at Huber, and once at Grosskreutz. Jurors also finished hearing from Corey Washington, who live-streamed the protests. He said he made a mental note of Rittenhouse early in the evening. Kind of looked young to me, and he had his gloves on, and he was smoking cigarettes and stuff. So I was, I don't know, I kind of was like, uh, he kind of seemed like an interesting figure, so I just took a mental note of that. It wasn't anything, I wouldn't say malicious, I just, you know, he, young person in a situation. The jury will continue hearing testimony from that lead detective on this case today. The court also has to deal with a potential juror issue today. Yesterday, the prosecution brought up at the very end of the day that one of the jurors had apparently made a joke about the case. The nature of that joke is not known. The judge said he will deal with that today. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranik, Spectrum News. The state called on Richie McGinnis on Thursday. He is the chief video director of The Daily Caller. He interviewed Kyle Rittenhouse just 14 minutes before he fatally shot Joseph Rosenbaum. The jury also heard from Ryan Balch. He's one of the armed men seen in video with Rittenhouse that night. Richie McGinnis said he didn't see people guarding businesses during protests on August 24th, 2020. That changed the next night. The presence of weapons, just in my mind, uh, is elevates the level of, of risk. He interviewed Rittenhouse and then followed Rittenhouse and Ryan Balch, another one of the armed men at that location. We were there to be more of a deterrence than anything. McGinnis stopped to talk with other protesters who were holding rocks, but he put his camera down. Then he noticed Rittenhouse running, holding a fire extinguisher in his gun, heading toward car source. It's not the way that I was taught to handle a weapon in a public place. McGinnis said he saw Rosenbaum throw a bag toward Rittenhouse and then appeared to lunge toward Rittenhouse and his gun. If they did make contact and it was um, just a glance, it wasn't enough to alter um, the trajectory of the rifle. That's when Rittenhouse shot his gun four times at Rosenbaum, including into his back. He never said, I want your gun, I'm going to take your gun, give me your gun, I'm going to steal your gun, anything along those lines. I didn't hear anything like that, no. McGinnis was one of the first people to provide aid to Rosenbaum after he was shot by Rittenhouse. The graphic video that McGinnis was recording was shown to the jurors. Both Rittenhouse and McGinnis had to divert their attention from the screen. McGinnis visibly struggling as he relived those moments before he took Rosenbaum to the hospital, where he helped load him onto a gurney and then shortly after saw Gage Grosskreutz, who was wounded after being shot by Rittenhouse. His bicep was effectively gone. Uh, and there was just a lot of blood. Something of note before the trial resumed Thursday morning, one juror was removed from the panel after he made a joke to a deputy while being escorted to his car on Tuesday. It was my understanding, it was something along the lines of, why did the Kenosha police shoot Jacob Blake seven times? Uh, it's my understanding that the rest of the joke is because they ran out of bolts. The juror admitted he did tell the joke, but didn't want to repeat it. He felt it wasn't connected to Rittenhouse and his charges. The judge disagreed. The public needs to be confident that this is a fair trial. And it, I think even at the, at the very most, it, it, was a, it was bad judgment to tell a joke of that nature. Prosecutors will continue to call witnesses to the stand Friday morning beginning at 9 o'clock. We have learned that Gage Grosskreutz, one of the men shot and injured by Rittenhouse, will be called to testify Monday morning. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranik, Spectrum News. The state has now called six witnesses to testify in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, which continues today. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranik has more from the courthouse. The state called on two new witnesses yesterday. Ryan McGinnis, the video director for The Daily Caller, who interviewed Rittenhouse just minutes before he opened fire, and Ryan Balch, one of the armed men who was seen with Rittenhouse in video that night. Balch testified to the jury that he came to Kenosha in August of 2020 to protect the businesses from rioters, looters, and arsonists. He also touched on the behavior of Joseph Rosenbaum, the first victim of Kyle Rittenhouse. Rosenbaum was right there in front of my face. 
yelling and screaming. And I would say, dude, back up. Just like, chill. I don't know what your problem is. And he goes, you know what? If I catch any of you guys alone tonight, I'm going to kill you. And he said that to you? Correct. Did he say that to the defendant as well? The defendant was there, so yes. Testimony will begin again this morning at 9 o'clock. We have also learned that Gage Grosskreutz, the person who was shot by Rittenhouse in the arm, will testify on Monday morning. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. Week one of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial is wrapping up today in Kenosha County. Our very own Andrew Havranek has been covering that trial for us. He joins us now from the Kenosha County Courthouse. So, Andrew, state continuing to make its case today. Who's been on the stand so far? Pete, today the state called Jason Lakowski. He was one of the armed men who was seen in videos that night in Kenosha during those protests. He lives in Green Bay now, but he lived in Brown Deer at the time. He said he came to Kenosha um, and he actually knew Ryan Balch. Uh, prior to that, uh, he was another one of those armed men. They came here to protect businesses. He was also armed, as I said, um, with an AR-15 style rifle at the time. And he said that he came here um, and the kind of the rules he was following was um, shout, shove, show, and shoot. And he said he never actually ended up having to get past that shout part when people were kind of getting agitated with him. The state also asked him about some of the behaviors that he saw Jason or Joseph Rosenbaum um, kind of portraying that night before he was shot by Kyle Rittenhouse. There's a lot of video of Rosenbaum saying, shoot me with some expletives in there. Um, uh, Lakowski said that he kind of experienced that. He experienced some of that shouting from Rosenbaum, but he said that they kind of just turned their turned away from him and didn't really consider him to be a threat. And that really is kind of the prosecution's kind of biggest part of all of this testimony is that the defense is trying to say that Kyle Rittenhouse acted in self-defense when he shot. The prosecution now has had somebody testify that uh, Rosenbaum really wasn't a threat to anybody, um, at least from Lakowski's point of view. So um, that has been kind of the questioning that he's been asked so far on the stand today. Cross examine, examination finished up uh, just before 11 o'clock. They took a little bit of a break, and then they're going to start uh, re examining, doing the redirect examination of him uh, this afternoon, so, um, or later this morning. So we sh should kind of learn a little bit more on what he has to say to the jury, Pete. A lot of good information there, Andrew. Of course, you mentioned Rosenbaum, uh, Rittenhouse accused of shooting three people. Two passed away, but one who's still alive. Any word on whether he will testify in this case? Yeah, Pete, we actually learned yesterday that Gage Grosskreutz will be called to testify. Uh, attorney, uh, uh, the, one of the prosecuting attorneys, Thomas Binger, who is the lead prosecutor in this case, was talking to the judge yesterday just about scheduling. Um, he said that he had a few people that he wanted to call today, but he didn't want to start with a big witness in this case late on a Friday afternoon. So that means, that, that kind of tells us that Gage Grosskreutz, his testimony is going to be pretty long and he is expected to be called to the stand on Monday morning. So that will be a really big key witness for the prosecution, Pete. One final question to get to Andrew, because I know you've been a very busy guy this week. We saw what there was a juror dismissed yesterday. You gave us some perspective on that yesterday about allegedly a joke that was cracked to a deputy, but was there another juror dismissed today? There was. So right before the trial kind of resumed for the day today, um, the attorneys were handed a few different pieces of paper. One was a handwritten note from a juror that had a question um, that wanted to be addressed, but the judge and the attorneys on both sides declined to address that comment that was written um, to them. But there was another juror who had expressed some medical issues, which was what it was described at, as at first. But then when the jury came down, the judge told the jury that one of the jurors, juror 27, um, as this young woman was known as, was dismissed um, because she's pregnant and was experiencing some discomfort. So we started off with a 20-person jury. We are now down to 18 people um, on this panel um, after that one was eliminated yesterday. So that means we have 10 women and eight men left on the panel. And um, I've been in the courtroom today and I've been live tweeting this entire um, trial through the whole week. And you can continue to follow those tweets um, at Andrew Drew underscore Havranek, and we also have all of my tweets going into a live blog um, on the Spectrum News app. So a lot of stuff happening uh, even on the last day of trial for the week, Pete. 
All right, our very own Andrew Hevranek covering this trial wall to wall for us. Andrew, thanks so much. The state called nine more witnesses to the stand Friday, the fifth day of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. That included character witnesses to give the jury a better look at how people were acting that night. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Hevranek continues our coverage live now from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew. Courtney, the state is trying to show the jury that Joseph Rosenbaum was not acting as an aggressor toward Kyle Rittenhouse. They're trying to argue against the claim that Rittenhouse acted in self-defense when he shot Rosenbaum, Anthony Huber, and Gage Grosskreutz. Now, um, one of the character witnesses that you just mentioned was called to the stand was Carrie Ann Swartz. She was the fiance of Joseph Rosenbaum. The state asked her some questions about the contents that was in that bag that Rosenbaum was seen on video throwing toward Rittenhouse just moments before he was shot. Um, his fiance said that in that bag she saw uh, some trial size deodorant, some toothbrush, toothpaste, and an empty water bottle. Um, she said he had just gotten out of the hospital and that was the bag that he was carrying when he was released. Now, um, the defense kind of took some issues with uh, some things that were said. They felt that those questions about what was in that hospital bag and that release from the hospital allowed them to ask her about his hospital stay. The judge said that he was not going to allow the defense to um, ask about why he was released from the hospital and what the hospital stay was about. But since the state asked about those medications, that was fair game. So they were able to ask her what the medications were that Rosenbaum took that day. And she mentioned a medication that he took for bipolar disorder. Now, the state also called several other witnesses, including um, several police officers who were on scene and did the investigative work um, that night. A DNA analyst was also called to explain uh, the DNA that was found on Rittenhouse's gun. Um, and then they also spoke um, to a man named Jason Lakowski. He was one of the armed men who protected, uh, came to Kenosha to protect car source. Um, he said that he did see Jason Rosenbaum that night. And in a lot of videos, you see Rosenbaum uh, shouting and um, saying to shoot him. Um, uh, Lakowski said he never heard that. And he said, well, he, he said that he kind of did a lot of um, false stepping is what uh, Lakowski said. But he said, as far as considering him a threat, he didn't consider him a threat, actually calling him a quote, blabbering idiot, um, and just kind of turned his shoulder and turned away from him, saying that he never felt threatened by Rosenbaum. And that was a big kind of point for the prosecution um, in today's case. Now, we do know that Gage Grosskreutz, the third man that Rittenhouse shot um, back in August 2020, is going to be testifying on Monday morning. The court is done for the day, and we're expecting him at 9 o'clock on Monday morning, Courtney. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Hevranek live in Kenosha. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. The second week of the trial for Kyle Rittenhouse begins today. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Hevranek has more on what we can expect and gives us a quick recap of what happened last week. Gage Grosskreutz, the man who Kyle Rittenhouse shot in the arm during protests in August 2020, is expected to take the stand to testify today. Prosecutors indicated last week that his testimony could take a lot of time, since he's the only person who survived after being shot by Rittenhouse. Last week, prosecutors focused heavily on the first victim, Joseph Rosenbaum, and the jury heard testimony from several key witnesses. Mr. Binger makes a big thing out of Kyle Rittenhouse was the only person who shot somebody that evening. True. Mr. Rittenhouse was the only person who was chased by Joseph Rosenbaum that evening. Rosenbaum was right there in front of my face, yelling and screaming. And I would say, dude, back up. Just chill. I don't know what your problem is. And he goes, you know what? If I catch any of you guys alone tonight, I'm going to kill you. What did you think of him? A babbling idiot. You didn't view him as a threat? Not at all. Prosecutors have indicated that they should rest their case sometime on Tuesday when the defense will present their argument of self-defense for Kyle Rittenhouse. The judge still expects this trial to be over by the end of the week. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. And who survived being shot by Kyle Rittenhouse during last year's protests in Kenosha took the stand today to testify 
about what happened that night. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Hevranek has the latest from the Kenosha County Courthouse. We've been hearing from Gage Grosskreutz, the man who was shot in the arm by Kyle Rittenhouse and survived after Rittenhouse fatally shot two other men during protests here in Kenosha on August 25th, 2020. Grosskreutz explained to the jury how he got involved in going to some of these demonstrations, saying it happened shortly after George Floyd was murdered by police in Minneapolis last May. He said he was volunteering his time to act as an EMT, as a medic, which he has trained back Ground in uh, to help people who may need any sort of medical attention. He was also live streaming all of the events that were happening here in Kenosha that night. And in that live stream, he had uh, pointed out that he had heard gunshots coming from behind him, and then he started running toward those gunshots. While he was running toward those gunshots, he came in contact with Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, he explained his interaction with Kyle Rittenhouse, who people were saying that he had just shot someone and Kyle Rittenhouse continues on while Gage Grosskreutz continues going toward where that shooting had just happened. He told the jury that his main focus that night was trying to find whoever that shooting victim happened to be. But as he was heading there, more people were saying that Rittenhouse was the person who shot him. So Gage Grosskreutz continued to follow Rittenhouse. And that was when he ultimately was shot in the arm just moments after Anthony Huber was fatally shot. Now he has provided some other testimony saying that he had actually seen Rittenhouse re-rack his AR-15 when his arms were up. And Grosskreutz said he kind of took that as Rittenhouse was not accepting his surrender. We've seen a lot of graphic video of the injury that Grosskreutz had on his arm, and he is continuing his testimony to the jury today. Um, and it is going to probably take several hours as this is a major witness for the prosecution. And one observation that I've made so far uh, during his testimony is that Gage Grosskreutz makes direct eye contact more so than any witness has so far with the jury. Even though Assistant District Attorney uh, Thomas Binger is asking these questions, he's directing his answers to the jury. And uh, that might try to play into the jury's emotional feel in all of this. Uh, uh, Cross-examination with the defense hasn't happened yet, but uh, we will continue to cover this on Spectrum News 1 and the Spectrum News app and live on Twitter. Live on Spectrum News 1, the lone survivor shot by Kyle Rittenhouse during those protests in Kenosha back in August of 2020 took the stand on Monday during day six of the trial there. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havrana continues our live coverage now from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew, what did the jury hear from that victim today? Jason, the jury heard from Gage Grosskreutz, a paramedic who said he was volunteering his time to help with anybody who may have needed any sort of medical attention during protests through all of 2020. He testified on the stand today that he thought he was going to die just moments before Kyle Rittenhouse shot him in the arm. Gage Grosskreutz didn't mince words when he described his emotion after seeing Kyle Rittenhouse shoot and kill Anthony Huber just moments before he was shot himself. What was going through your mind at this particular moment? That I was going to die. Grosskreutz started attending protests after the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis in May 2020, but said he was not taking a side. We weren't going to be actively uh, participating in any of the demonstrations. Uh, I think there's a, essentially a, a, an ethic code that if you are providing medical care, it, it, you shouldn't necessarily choose a side. Grosskreutz said he was also live streaming on Facebook, as he's also a legal observer for the American Civil Liberties Union, in addition to being a trained paramedic. I thought that was the best way that night that I could provide um, another aspect or another perspective of um, an unbiased account. Um, I mean, video doesn't lie. In Grosskreutz's video, you hear the gunshots fired by Rittenhouse that killed Joseph Rosenbaum. Grosskreutz starts running toward the gunshots, saying he wanted to help whoever had been hurt. Then he ran into Kyle Rittenhouse. You shot somebody? You hear me ask the question, who's shot? Who is shot? Um, at that moment, the only thing I was concerned about was finding this person who had been shot or 
presumably had been shot. Grosskreutz said he continued toward the car source, but then as people started yelling, saying Rittenhouse had shot someone, he turned around and started heading toward him. I thought that the defendant was um, an active shooter. He described remembering seeing Anthony Hubert use his skateboard to hit Rittenhouse moments before he was fatally shot in the chest. Grosskreutz was just feet away and approached Rittenhouse with his hands up. He said Rittenhouse re-racked his gun, which was pointed at him. Grosskreutz said he wanted to detain or disarm Rittenhouse, but then he was shot. I was never trying to kill the defendant. I was never never something that I was trying to do. Rittenhouse's defense disagreed, saying Rittenhouse only shot Grosskreutz when he pointed his handgun at his head. When you were standing three to five feet from him with your arms up in the air, he never fired, right? Correct. Attorney Corey Shirofsky asked Grosskreutz if he had any regrets about that night and about a post made by his then roommate on Facebook. That included a photo with Grosskreutz in the hospital. If your intent was to shoot the defendant with your Glock pistol, would you have gotten that close to him? That was my intent, no. Jason, the jury also heard from other witnesses today, including a Kenosha police officer who was on the scene that night that Kyle Rittenhouse walked toward with his hands up after the shooting. That officer said he did not view that as a surrender, even though Rittenhouse was armed, because other men who were armed at the protests that night would put their hands up when police would come near them just to show that they were not a threat to the officers. Now, last week, we did hear prosecuting attorneys say that they plan to rest their case and finish up calling some uh, witnesses on Tuesday, which is tomorrow. Testimony will resume tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, and we will be here throughout everything. Reporting live tonight in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. The defense set to step into the spotlight. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek live in Kenosha for us there tonight. Andrew, thank you for joining us here. A key witness took the stand for day six of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial as prosecutors continued to try and convince the jury that Rittenhouse did not act in self-defense. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Hivrenik recaps what happened Monday and looks ahead to what we can expect today. Yesterday, the jury heard from Gage Grosskreutz. He is the only person Kyle Rittenhouse shot last August who is still alive today. He told the jury that he thought he was going to die just moments before he was shot in the arm, seconds after Anthony Huber was fatally shot in the chest by Rittenhouse. Grosskreutz tried to paint a picture that Rittenhouse had re-racked his gun while Grosskreutz's hands were up in the air in a surrender position, and that's when he said he was shot. But the defense said otherwise. When you were standing three to five feet from him with your arms up in the air, he never fired, right? Correct. Prosecutors made a comment to the judge last week that they expected to be finished with their case sometime on Tuesday. So we will continue to watch to see when the prosecution hands the case over to Rittenhouse's defense. Testimony begins again at nine o'clock. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. The state expected to rest today in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. The defense will then call its witnesses. Prosecutors put Gage Grosskreutz on the stand Monday. He is one of the three men shot by Rittenhouse and the only one to survive. He recounted the night Rittenhouse shot him in Kenosha in August of 2020. Before he was shot, Grosskreutz is seen on video pointing a handgun at Rittenhouse. He testified that was not intentional. Defense attorneys argue Rittenhouse shot Grosskreutz and the other two men in self-defense. The seventh day of testimony in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial now underway as the state gets closer to resting its case. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek is at the Kenosha County Courthouse. So, Andrew, who's the jury heard from today so far? Courtney, the jury so far has heard from Dr. Doug Kelly. He is a forensic pathologist with the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office, and he is the one who performed autopsies on both Anthony Huber and Joseph Rosenbaum. Now, he was able to explain to the jury um, a couple different things. He was able to explain uh, the gunshot wounds and how those wounds affected each of those two men. Um, as we know, Anthony Huber was shot once in the chest. That, Dr. Kelly said, was the 
fatal wound uh, to Anthony Huber. And then, as we know, Joseph Rosenbaum had was shot four times um, that night back in August of 2020. He explained how those bullets traveled um, through those men and kind of explained their wounds as well, saying that uh, Rosenbaum had extensive injuries to his hand, said he had um, an injury to his groin area and to his right uh, pelvic bone um, there, and then said that the fatal shot was one that was actually um, shot from the back through into the chest. It said, he said that that uh, bullet had extensively damaged um, his lung and his liver, and that there was a lot of bleeding inside of his chest. So that, he said, was the fatal shot. And kind of the key kind of part of his testimony there was that the first two shots were fired when Rosenbaum was standing up, and the second two shots were fired, including that fatal shot, as um, Kelly said, Rosenbaum was kind of more perpendicular to the ground that moment when Rosenbaum is falling forward. And that is what he explained uh, to the jury, Courtney. Yeah, and again, the defense is trying to prove that Kyle Rittenhouse shot these individuals in self-defense. Andrew, there were some pretty graphic photos of those autopsies shown in the courtroom. What was Kyle Rittenhouse's reaction to that? Yeah, some of those photos were extremely graphic, um, as we're seeing autopsy photos of two men um, who had just died hours prior to those autopsies being performed. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse would look um, at the screen when those photos were shown, um, specifically when the hand was shown um, of Joseph Rosenbaum. He was able to look at that a little bit more um, and to see those uh, wounds to uh, Joseph Rosenbaum's hand. But when things got a little bit more graphic, Kyle Rittenhouse became a little bit more uncomfortable. You could see him diverting his attention away from the screen. Um, at times, um, one of our other reporters, uh, Megan Marshall, is here with me as well, um, had kind of noticed that he kind of looked visibly um, shaken and kind of uh, almost uh, looking a, a little bit ill um, while some of those photos were being shown. Um, so, and we've kind of seen that throughout this trial as well. When things have been shown, Kyle Rittenhouse will look away from the screen. So, kind of um, on par for what we've seen so far. And the state is expected to rest its case today, and then the case goes to uh, the defense. Yeah, Courtney, last week, uh, the uh, lead prosecutor, um, a, Assistant District Attorney Thomas Binger, had made a comment to the judge that he expected to be finished with his case sometime on Tuesday. Now it is Tuesday, so um, we're expecting prosecutors to rest their case and the defense to pick everything up um, and to present their argument, saying that Kyle Rittenhouse acted that night here in August 2020 in self-defense. Um, so once that continues, the judge still is expecting this trial to only last two weeks. So uh, we're getting closer to the end of this trial, Courtney. Andrew Havranek reporting from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew, thank you. Now to the latest on the Kyle Rittenhouse trial live here on Spectrum News 1. After the prosecution arrested its case on Tuesday, the defense took center stage in a trial that has captured the country's attention. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek continues our coverage now live from the Kenosha County Courthouse. And Andrew, how do prosecutors wrap things up on Tuesday? Yeah, Jason, prosecutors wrap things up by calling Dr. Doug Kelly to the stand. He is a forensics pathologist who works for the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office. He performed the autopsies on both Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber. Kyle Rittenhouse looked away as Dr. Doug Kelly explained how the bullets from his gun hit and killed Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber, showing photos of their autopsies to the jury. Mr. Rosenbaum has a number of injuries. Kelly said the autopsy alone does not allow him to determine what injuries came first. He said the videos of the shooting are able to help. He said the first shot at Rosenbaum was to the hip, then the hand, then a bullet grazed his head, and then a shot was to the back. This gunshot wound is a lethal injury. And what do you mean by that? Uh, this uh, gunshot wound is the uh, uh, one that would cause um, death as a result of the injuries to the lungs and the liver with the hemorrhage and the uh, injury to the organs themselves. Kelly said the final two shots, including the fatal shot, came from the back to the front of Rosenbaum's body. The, the only way that the uh, trajectories of the gunshot wounds to the right side of the head and the back make sense is if he's more horizontal to the ground, and that is occurring um, at the time that the last two gunshot wounds are heard on the video. The defense argued that was because he was lunging at Rittenhouse. The state said it was because Rosenbaum's hip 
had been shot and he was falling. The defense questioned Kelly extensively about the injuries to Rosenbaum's hand. Lead defense attorney Mark Richards had the main detective demonstrate with Rittenhouse's gun how those injuries could happen and how close his hand had to be. This is a, a close range injury um, and uh, so his hand is in close proximity or in contact with the end of that rifle. With that, the state rested its case against Rittenhouse and his defense began calling their own witnesses. The first was Nick Smith, who once worked at CarSource. He said he was asked by the family who owns the business for help protecting it. He said he remembers Rittenhouse coming back to the car source and learning about the shootings. Uh, he repeats, uh, I just shot someone over and over, and I believe at some point he did say he had to shoot someone. Another woman, Joanne Feidler, seen in photos protecting the business, also remembers Rittenhouse returning after the shootings. And he sat down, I remember him pulling his hair back, and he's pulling it back really hard, and just as common was, my God, my life might be over. And just, we're just like, okay, calm down. Did Kyle respond to anything that was said? Yes. What was that? That was that he had to. But he did say that he had to do it. Is that right? Yes. I don't have anything else. Any question? There we are. Mr. Columbia. Now, the state called 22 witnesses to testify while they presented their case to the jury. The defense so far has called four witnesses. We're not sure how many witnesses the defense plans to call, but as far as we know, the trial is still on schedule, Jason. Andrew, I know we talked about it last week. It's the big question right now. Is there any indication that Kyle Rittenhouse himself will take the stand? Yeah, Jason, last week during opening statements, attorney Mark Richards said to the jury that they would hear from Kyle Rittenhouse. At first, it was believed that maybe that was through uh, testimony from himself, but uh, that could also mean that maybe they would just hear from him through videos. Obviously, that would be a key testimony for the defense in this case, but right now we're not sure either way whether or not Rittenhouse will take the stand in his own trial. We'll see what happens this week. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Hrenik live for us there in Kenosha. Andrew, thank you for joining us. It's now the defense's turn to call witnesses in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek is covering that trial wall-to-wall -wall for us and filed this report from Kenosha County. Just before court ended for the day yesterday, the defense asked the judge and the prosecution if either of them had an objection to using Zoom to call one of their witnesses in to testify. It's unclear who that witness is, but neither side objected to using Zoom in this trial. Yesterday, the defense called on four witnesses, two people who were with Rittenhouse the night he fatally shot two people and injured a third, another one who witnessed the shooting, and one who took pictures of the protests that night. The one woman who was with Rittenhouse for a part of the night recalled the moments Rittenhouse returned to the car source after the shootings. And he sat down, and I remember him pulling his hair back and he's pulling it back really hard and just as common was, my God, my life might be over. And just, we're just like, okay, calm down. Did Kyle respond to anything that was said? Yes. What was that? That was that he had to. But he did say that he had to do it. Is that right? Yes. I don't have anything else. During his opening statement, defense attorney Mark Richards told the jury that they would hear from Kyle Rittenhouse during this trial. It was unclear whether or not he meant that Rittenhouse would take the stand or if they would just hear from him through the videos that are shown as evidence. It is still unclear whether or not he will take the stand in his trial. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranik, Spectrum News. Defense of Kyle Rittenhouse now in day two of witness testimony. And today, Rittenhouse himself took the stand. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranik is at the Kenosha County Courthouse. So, Andrew, the court took a break because Rittenhouse broke down on the stand. Yeah, visibly shaken, uh, struggling to kind of catch his breath, crying uncontrollably um, as he was recalling the moments just before the fatal shooting of Joseph Rosenbaum, uh, those four shots that were fire fired by Kyle Rittenhouse the night of August 25th, 2020 here in Kenosha. He was recalling the moments that he was walking back to what they're referring to as, um, I believe, Car Source 3 um, in this case, um, and uh, he he had picked up a fire extinguisher from somebody at a gas station um, and he was going there to 
put out fires. He said he got a call from somebody that was at the scene saying he needed to get there um, and put out fires at that location. He said when he got there, um, one of the vehicles that they refer to in court as the Duramax vehicle, Rittenhouse said he saw a flame in the back seat of that. He said he approached that vehicle and that is when he saw Joshua Zeminski. Now Zeminski has been identified as the person who fired the first shot just before Rittenhouse fired the four shots into Joseph Rosenbaum. Kyle Rittenhouse said he approached Zeminski and Zeminski approached with a pistol in his hand. Rittenhouse said on the stand that he backed away from that position and he wanted to go in the opposite direction, but he couldn't. He said he felt that he was cornered by Zeminski and Rittenhouse, and, or excuse me, Zeminski and Rosenbaum, and that is when he was on the stand and broke down in tears. We also have a camera on Mrs. Rittenhouse, Kyle Rittenhouse's mom. She also was very visibly shaken as her son was on the stand um, trying to catch his breath. The court did take a recess during that emotional uh, testimony, but he will be resuming um, his testimony on the stand today, Courtney. Andrew, were you able to see any reaction from jurors as Rittenhouse and his mom were, were both crying today in the courtroom? So I am not in the courtroom and we do not have a, fee, a video feed of the jurors. So I do not, I do not know what um, the jurors reaction was. Um, uh, we do have a pool reporter inside. Um, let me just check to see um, if we have a report from them. Uh, we do. Um, many looked up at him in apparent uh, sympathy. Um, our pool reporter is saying from inside the courtroom um, said on a courtroom bench across the room. Again, Rittenhouse's mother sobbed loudly, um, but again, jurors according to the pool reporter inside the courtroom, um, looked up at him in apparent sympathy um, as Kyle Rittenhouse was on the stand um, uncontrollably sobbing. Was this expected today, Rittenhouse being called to testify? The defense just started seating witnesses yesterday. Yeah, it was it was a surprise, Courtney. Um, yesterday, right before uh, the uh, trial kind of ended for the day, um, the defense had asked the prosecutors if they had any issues with using Zoom to call one of their witnesses. We've learned that um, one of their witnesses um, had contracted COVID and needs to testify via Zoom. There was no objection to any of that. But we also know from the last pretrial hearing in this case that um, the defense wants to call a use of force expert. So everybody was still kind of expecting um, those two testimonies. And then right before uh, Rittenhouse took the stand himself, um, uh, Gage Grosskreutz's former roommate uh, was on the stand as well. So Kyle Rittenhouse taking the stand today was a shock to pretty much everybody. Um, and if, uh, if, if it was a shock to pretty much everybody that's down here in the media workroom, that could be a shock to the prosecution as well. Maybe this is a way to maybe catch the prosecution off guard when they have the opportunity to cross-examine um, Kyle Rittenhouse. Maybe that was a, maybe a tactic by the defense. We're not sure, but definitely something that nobody was expecting today, Courtney. Andrew Evranick reporting from Kenosha County. Thanks so much for today's update on the trial. Live now on Spectrum News 1 as Kyle Rittenhouse took the stand in his own defense today on day eight of his trial there. He's facing multiple charges after shooting and killing two men and shooting and injuring a third during those protests in Kenosha back in August of 2020. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havrana continues our coverage now live from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew, to some, a bit of an unexpected move there today. Yeah, Jason, it really was a bit of an unexpected move for the defense to call Kyle Rittenhouse to testify in his trial so early in them presenting witnesses in this case. The defense did say they have three more witnesses to call in this trial, but Kyle Rittenhouse is by far the biggest they have in their case. Wendy Rittenhouse appeared to mouth the words, I love you, buddy, as her son, Kyle, took the witness stand in his own trial early Wednesday morning. The two began uncontrollably crying as Rittenhouse recalled the moments before he fatally shot Joseph Rosenbaum. Mr. Rosenbaum was now running from my right side, um, and I was cornered from in front of me with Mr. Zeminski. And there were <laughs> there were three people right there. <laughs> this is a deep breath, 
<laughs> the court took a break and Rittenhouse returned to the stand. After he throws the bag and he continues to run, he's gaining speed on me. A gunshot is fired from behind me, directly behind me. And I take a few steps and that's when I turn around. And as I'm turning around, Mr. Rosenbaum is, I would say, from me to where the judge is uh, coming at me with his arms out in front of him. He, he, I remember his hand on the barrel of my gun. As you see him lunging at you, what do you do? I shoot him. And how many times did you shoot? I believe four. He was then asked about the moments leading to the fatal shooting of Anthony Huber. Rittenhouse said he had been hit twice by Huber's skateboard. He grabs my gun and I can feel it pulling away from me and this, I can feel the strap starting to come off my, my body. That's when Rittenhouse said he shot Huber in the chest. Then he described the shooting of Gage Grosskreutz, saying Grosskreutz had his hands up as he approached. His arm is like that with me on the ground and his pistol is pointed at me and that's when I shoot him. After shooting Grosskreutz, Rittenhouse said he was walking toward police to turn himself in. I tell the officer, I just shot somebody, I just shot somebody. And the officer says, get the back or you're going to get pepper sprayed. Go home, go home, go home. He explains he didn't go to the Kenosha Police Department because of the protests. So he was driven back to Antioch, where his mom took him to the police there. I was vomiting and having panic attacks and my head was spinning and I couldn't think clearly at that point. During cross-examination, the defense objected to Assistant District Attorney Thomas Binger, who started questioning Rittenhouse about a comment he made nearly two weeks before the protests, saying he wished he had his gun to shoot shoplifters. The defense also felt Binger was questioning Rittenhouse about his right to remain silent before testifying in court. I asked the court to strongly admonish him, and the next time it happens, I'll be asking for a mistrial with prejudice. He's an experienced attorney and he knows better. You are already, you were, I, I was a, astonished when you began your examination by commenting on the defendant's post-arrest silence. That's basic law, it's been basic law in this country for 40 years, 50 years. I have no idea why you would do something like that. And it gives, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I don't know what you're up to. So I'm attempting to impeach the defendant on his beliefs. I believe I'm entitled to impeach the defendant on his beliefs and on his statements. Now, the defense did file a motion for a mistrial with prejudice. Now, what does that mean? That means if the judge does accept that motion, that the state would not be able to retry this case. The judge does have that motion under consideration. However, right before everything ended today, the judge asked both the prosecution and defense if they wanted to work on Saturday. They voted no, so it does seem that the jury will get this case to deliberate on Monday. Reporting live in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. Still so many moving parts to all of this right now. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek live in Kenosha. Andrew, as always, thank you for joining us here. The defense will continue to call witnesses this morning in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. Now, Rittenhouse himself took the stand yesterday, and Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek recaps some of that testimony. The first person that the defense will call to the stand today is Dr. John Black. He's a use of force expert that the defense hopes will show the jury that Rittenhouse acted in self-defense and that the use of deadly force was allowed in the situations where he fatally shot two people and injured a third back in August of 2020. But by far the biggest witness that the defense has in this case is Kyle Rittenhouse himself. And he did take the stand yesterday and testified for nearly the entire day in court. This is what happened when he was recalling the moments that led to the fatal shooting of Joseph Rosenbaum. Mr. Rosenbaum was now running from my right side um, and I was cornered from in front of me with Mr. Zeminski and there were There were three people right there. Take a deep breath, 
Again, the defense says it has three more witnesses to call to present their case to the jury. After that is finished, both sides will give their closing arguments, and the jury is expected to receive this case to start deliberations on Monday. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Hevranek, Spectrum News. The defense continues to call witnesses in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Hevranek has this update on what was heard so far in the courtroom today. The first person the defense called to the stand today was Dr. John Black. He's a use of force expert who the defense had analyzed the videos from the night of August 25th, 2020 to find out the timing of all of the shots that Kyle Rittenhouse shot that night. He testified on the stand that the entire situation from the first gunshot that Rittenhouse fired to the very end uh, after uh, Gage Grosskreutz was shot in the arm was one minute and 20 seconds. He broke down the distance and the time that elapsed after each shot that was fired for both the Joseph Rosenbaum shooting, which was four gunshots, and then the shootings of Anthony Huber and Gage Grosskreutz as well. Now, during cross-examination, Thomas Binger, the assistant district attorney, asked for some more data, so he has not finished his cross-examination yet, uh, but the defense had no objections to that, so that use of force expert is getting some of that data for him now, and the defense has has called up two more witnesses. One is a officer who was working with the Kenosha Police Department in August of 2020. She's the one who gathered evidence from the scene. Uh, the defense tried to use her to prove that Kyle Rittenhouse did not re-rack his gun. That's something that Gage Grosskreutz alleged during his testimony. The cross-examination tried to prove that, in fact, Rittenhouse did re-rack that gun. And another person that the defense has called is Drew Hernandez. He calls him a himself a professional commentator. He works now for Real America's Voice, which is a conservative uh, website and outlet. Um, the defense is trying to use him to analyze the video that he shot that night, both from body cam footage and his cell phone, and the prosecution is trying to prove that this witness is biased, saying that the attorney that Drew Hernandez used to provide the evidence is an attorney from the same firm the defense used for one of their legal experts in this case. Uh, uh, the judge said early this morning that he thought yesterday that today was Friday, um, so he said his whole schedule was kind of mixed up there, so he is expecting the jury to get this case on Friday, not Monday. But we will continue to watch uh, for the latest developments in this case uh, here in Kenosha. Well, Rittenhouse's defense team finished presenting their case to the jury on Thursday, a jury who is set to soon determine his fate for fatally shooting two men and injuring a third during those protests in Kenosha back in August of 2020. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havrana continues our coverage now from the Kenosha County Courthouse. The defense called its last three witnesses, a use of force expert, a police officer who gathered evidence from the scene where Anthony Huber and Gage Grosskreutz were shot, and a man who was in Kenosha that night recording the protests. Drew Hernandez said he traveled to many protests in 2020, including what he called riots in Kenosha. I felt like it could have possibly been a riot on the first night. So when I showed up, it turned out to be a very violent riot. He recalled when he first saw Kyle Rittenhouse that night, based on the video he recorded. It happened when Hernandez said rioters were yelling at armed men on the top of the car source roof. The first time I saw Kyle, he actually de-escalated a situation. He also recalled seeing Joseph Rosenbaum, the first person Rittenhouse shot and killed. He led the charge uh, into the gas station. He was getting physically aggressive. Uh, he appeared to be attempting to start a physical altercation with people in the gas station uh, to the point where he was telling one of the individuals with a rifle, shoot me N-word, shoot me N-word, uh, clearly attempting to start a physical altercation. The prosecution argued Hernandez is biased toward the defendant. He now works for Real America Voice as a professional commentator, but also said he's a journalist. Assistant District Attorney Thomas Binger said he made comments that supported Rittenhouse on Twitter. Is it your practice? as a journalist to interject your personal opinion into the stories you're re reporting on? No. But you did that here. The defense also called on Officer Brittany Bray. She collected evidence from the site where Anthony Huber and Gage Grosskreutz were shot. The defense wanted to use her testimony to argue against what Gage Grosskreutz said earlier this week, that Kyle Rittenhouse re-racked his gun, a process the defense said brings a distinct motion. Four inches, is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. 
And to clear the weapon, you have to take it all the way back and let it all the way forward. Yes. Prosecutors, though, say he did. Have you ever had a situation in which you have pulled the trigger, the round has fired, but the spent shell casing did not automatically eject like it should? Yes. And then that process you've described would be the way of ejecting that spent shell casing? Correct. The defense also called Dr. John Black to the stand. He broke down video from that night to explain to the jury how fast the shootings happened. He said from the first shot at Rosenbaum to the last shot at Grosskreutz, it was one minute and 20 seconds. But he told the jury video does have its limitations. The video can't tell you what each one of you are looking at. And it can't tell you what either actor in there was looking at, attending to, nor perceiving. Both sides agreed that they wanted to move closing arguments to the jury on Monday instead of Friday. The judge is allowing it, but he is capping both sides closing arguments at two and a half hours each. The jury will not come to court on Friday. They will return Monday at nine o'clock. However, attorneys and the judge will be back in the courtroom working on some final procedural things on Friday. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranik, Spectrum News. The jury will not be in court today in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse as lawyers on both sides meet to hash out some procedural matters before closing arguments next week. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranik is covering this trial for us and reports from Kenosha County. There hasn't been much that the prosecution and defense have agreed on during the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, but they did agree to present their closing arguments to the jury on Monday instead of today. They asked the judge to move it to Monday and the judge accepted, but the judge in turn put a cap on how much time each side gets for closing arguments. He said jury instruction will likely take 45 minutes to an hour, so he's limiting both sides to a total of two and a half hours each. That would mean the jury will likely begin deliberations sometime late Monday afternoon. Yesterday, the defense called its final witnesses before resting its case, including a use of force expert who analyzed the video in this case. The video can't tell you what each one of you are looking at. And it can't tell you what either actor in there was looking at, attending to, nor perceiving. The state wants the courts to add instructions for some of the lesser charges in this case. We'll have a full update later today. Andrew Havranik, Spectrum News. The second week of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial has wrapped up. Closing arguments set to happen Monday. And today the jury was not in the courtroom. That allowed both the state and the defense to hash things out with the judge. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranik joining us from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew, some pretty significant items on the table today. Yeah, Courtney, the judge and the attorneys had to discuss what instructions the jury will receive early Monday morning. The judge is allowing for several lesser charges to be given to the jury to consider in this case. We'll get to that in a moment, but first, let's talk about what the judge will not consider. He said he will not consider lesser charges for the first degree, for the count of first degree intentional homicide of Joseph Rosenbaum. The state wanted the jury to be able to consider the reckless homicide charge there as well, but the judge judge said no. The judge also said no to allowing a lesser charge for first degree reckless endangerment that Rittenhouse faces for firing two shots at the unidentified man that we've identified in court as jump kick man. Now, the judge is allowing lesser charges for the death of Anthony Huber. Rittenhouse is charged with first-degree intentional homicide there, but the jury will be allowed to consider second-degree intentional homicide and first-degree reckless homicide. The judge is taking two lesser charges into consideration. The first, dealing with the first-degree reckless endangerment charge for Richie McGinnis of the Daily Caller. Uh, he was just behind Joseph Rosenbaum when he was shot by Rittenhouse, and the judge is also considering considering lesser charges to be considered for the first degree attempted intentional homicide. The defense objected, saying that they don't know how you can um, recklessly attempt something. The judge said right now he is inclined to, degree, to agree with the state and why they want those lesser charges, and he will come back and give them the, his ultimate decision in allowing this sometime on Saturday, Courtney. Okay, so a few things still up in the air for Monday. The jury will get their instructions and then, and then what else for the day? 
Yeah, so right now what we understand how Monday will work is the jurors will come to the courtroom at 9 a.m. They will take about 45 minutes to an hour on receiving their instructions. From there, the both sides will be able to present their closing arguments and argue their case in front of the jury. And then once those cases, once those arguments are closed and the state has a chance to offer their rebuttal, they will then have a kind of a random lottery drawing on who the 12 jurors will be who will decide the fate of Kyle Rittenhouse. As you recall, two jurors have already been dismissed from this case. So instead of pulling from a pool of 20 names, they will pull from a pool of 18 names and the device that they will use to pull these jurors names is actually like a like a bingo or a raffle kind of machine where you're turning the little turnstile and then they'll be able to pull a name from that device to determine uh, who will be on the 12 person jury. All right. So a lot happening on Monday. Andrew Havranek reporting from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Thank you. With the jury out of the courtroom on Friday, Kyle Rittenhouse's defense team, the prosecutors, and the judge hammered out what specifically will be on the table Monday for closing arguments and the jury's deliberation in the high-profile case. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek brings us up to speed. Kyle Rittenhouse faces six charges in this case, the most serious being first-degree intentional homicide. But all of those charges carry what are called lesser-included charges that the jury could be allowed to consider when they decide the fate of Kyle Rittenhouse. Judge Bruce Schrader explained to Kyle Rittenhouse the lesser-included charges that he is allowing the jury to consider while they work to find him guilty or not on the six counts he faces. If I allow those, then the jury, if they are unable to agree that you're guilty of the charge defense, will have the opportunity to consider whether you're guilty of the less serious offense and could return that as a verdict as an alternative to instead returning a verdict of not guilty. The state argued for several lesser included charges to be added to the instructions given to the jury on Monday. The judge allowed three lesser charges to be added for consideration in the death of Anthony Huber. The initial charge there is first degree intentional homicide. I think first degree, second degree lesser included, first degree reckless are all appropriate. Second degree reckless doesn't fit. Judge Schrader is considering lesser included charges for two of the counts Rittenhouse faces. One is first degree reckless endangerment of Richie McGinnis from the Daily Caller, who was behind Rosenbaum when he was fatally shot. He's also considering lesser included charges for the first degree attempted homicide charge for shooting Gage Grosskreutz in the arm. My bias would be in favor of giving the submitting that verdict and giving this instruction but if it shows up on your doorstep uh, your email doorstep tomorrow at some point and it doesn't it isn't in there don't be terribly surprised the judge is not allowing lesser included charges for the first degree reckless homicide charge for killing joseph rosenbaum he's also not allowing any lesser charges for the attempted reckless endangerment of the man known in court as jump kick man i think somebody would say you're the behavior is either it's either reckless or it's not. I don't know how you can attempt to be reckless or attempt to be negligent. I don't know how you can do those things. A good portion of the day Friday was going over video for the state to have the judge allow the instruction for provocation to be given to the jury. Prosecutors say Rittenhouse provoked the shootings by raising his gun at Rosenbaum before Rosenbaum chased him. The jury should be given the instruction that they should consider it because if he raised this gun, it's clear provocation. The defense's position is that Rosenbaum was yelling, gun, gun, gun. Why do you think he was yelling, gun, gun, gun? The judge is allowing the instruction for provocation. The judge will make a decision on those lesser included charges on Saturday. The jury returns to the courtroom at 9 o'clock Monday morning. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. A Kenosha County jury today will hear closing arguments in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse is accused of shooting three people, killing two of them during a night of unrest in Kenosha in the summer of 2020. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek has been covering this trial for us and previews a jam-packed day at the Kenosha County Courthouse. 
The jury will start today hearing the instructions from Judge Bruce Schrader that they will have to follow when they start discussing whether or not Kyle Rittenhouse is guilty of the charges he faces. From there, the state will give its closing argument. They will work to paint the picture that Kyle Rittenhouse provoked the whole situation that started with the shooting death of Joseph Rosenbaum and ended with the shooting death of Anthony Huber and injury to Gage Grosskreutz. The defense will get to present its closing argument. Well, they will claim Rittenhouse acted in self self-defense, saying Rosenbaum provoked the shootings. Each side will get up to two and a half hours each. From there, a lottery drawing will determine which 12 of the 18 jurors will decide Rittenhouse's fate. A lot happened in the second week of Rittenhouse's trial. Here's a look back at some of the key moments. Re-racking the weapon, in my mind, meant that the defendant pulled the trigger while my hands were in the air but the gun didn't fire. When you were standing three to five feet from him with your arms up in the air, he never fired, right? Correct. And he sat down, I remember him pulling his hair back and he's pulling it back really hard and just as common was, my God, my life might be over. And just, we're just like, okay, calm down. Did Kyle respond to anything that was said? Yes. What was that? That was that he had to. Mr. Rosenbaum was now running from my right side um, and I was cornered from in front of me with Mr. Zeminski and there were <laughs> there were three people right there. <laughs> Governor Tony Evers said 500 Wisconsin National Guard soldiers will be on standby for the verdict in the Rittenhouse trial. The jury is expected to start deliberating sometime later this afternoon. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Haveranik, Spectrum News. Live on Spectrum News 1, the case against Kyle Rittenhouse is now essentially in the hands of a 12-person jury after both the state and defense argued their case for the final time on Monday as to why Rittenhouse is guilty. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek continues our coverage now live from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew, how did the two sides close out their cases today? Yeah, Jason, the state continued to argue that Kyle Rittenhouse was an active shooter who provoked the shootings on August 25th, 2020. His defense argues that despite being the only person who shot and killed another person during those protests, that Kyle Rittenhouse was the only person who was chased by Joseph Rosenbaum. In his closing argument, Kenosha County Assistant District Attorney Thomas Binger said the defense for Kyle Rittenhouse is hypocritical. Because according to the defense, if someone has a gun, they're a threat. If someone points a gun, they're a threat. There's only one exception to that. The defendant, by their logic, he gets to run around with a gun all night. But, oh, we're not supposed to take him as a threat. He made the argument that Kyle Rittenhouse was an active shooter that night. Every day we read about heroes that stop active shooters. That's what was going on here. And that crowd was right. And that crowd was full of heroes. And that crowd did something that, honestly, I'm not sure I would have had the courage to do. The state argues Rittenhouse was the provocateur for all the events that happened that night, starting with the shooting death of Joseph Rosenbaum. What you don't do is you don't bring a gun to a fist fight. The state claims Rittenhouse raised his gun at Rosenbaum and Joshua Zeminski. The defense says otherwise. This is right-handed, pointing the gun this way, up at the ready. His back would be to the drone footage. In the drone footage, you see the arm. It would be somebody having to hold the gun left-handed. This is a right-handed firearm. Richards argues Rittenhouse was not an active shooter that night, like the state claims. The state wants to call my client an active shooter. And the reason they want to do that is because of the loaded connotations of that word. Richards also argued Rittenhouse did not provoke the shootings. He was a bad man. He was there. He was causing trouble. He was a rioter. And my client had to deal with him that night alone. 
Instead, Richards said there's a reason the state never mentioned Rittenhouse provoking the night until closing arguments. Did you hear one word out of Mr. Binger's mouth about provocation? You didn't, because it was never said. But when his case explodes in his face, now he comes out with provocation. Now, the jury was asked what time they would like to come back tomorrow to start deliberations. A majority of them said they would like to start at 9 o'clock in the morning. That is when all 18 people on the current panel will be reduced to 12, using that uh, kind of bingo um, tumbler that they'll select the 12 jurors who would decide this case. Those other six will still have to be here at the courthouse in case one of the jurors is dismissed for any sort of reason, Jason. Andrew, quickly, the judge threw out that gun possession charge that Kyle Rittenhouse was facing for being 17 years old with that AR-15. What was the reasoning on Monday morning? Yeah, so this was a point of contention on Friday as well as early this morning. The state said the defense never raised the issue about the length of the barrel of that gun. Today it was brought up again. Uh, the state said that they didn't have to bring that up because the defense didn't, but then they said to the judge that they weren't going to raise that issue, so the judge tossed that out, um, saying that the state did not prove that the length of that gun um, was illegal for him to have. Still a lot of moving parts to all of this as we move forward into Tuesday. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek joining us live in Kenosha tonight. Andrew, as always, thank you so much. Happening this morning, jurors will begin deliberating in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. They've now heard roughly two weeks of testimony, closing arguments, and gotten instructions from the judge. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek brings us up to speed on the case. A 12-person jury will begin deliberations this morning to decide the fate of Kyle Rittenhouse, who was charged in the shooting deaths of two men and injury of a third person here during protests in Kenosha last August. Yesterday, the jurors heard more than five hours of combined closing arguments from the state and the defense. The state claims that Kyle Rittenhouse was an active shooter that night and provoked the whole incident. The defense says otherwise, saying he wasn't an active shooter and he was being chased by Joseph Rosenbaum, which led to everything. Here are some key moments from the closing arguments. According to the defense, if someone has a gun, they're a threat. If someone points a gun, they're a threat. There's only one exception to that. The defendant, by their logic, he gets to run around with a gun all night. But, oh, we're not supposed to take him as a threat. Did you hear one word out of Mr. Binger's mouth about provocation? You didn't, because it was never said. But when his case explodes in his face, now he comes out with provocation. Yesterday, the judge did dismiss that gun possession charge by a minor, which was a misdemeanor in this case. So the jury will now decide whether or not Kyle Rittenhouse is guilty of five different counts. We will continue to be here through jury deliberations, and we will bring you a verdict as soon as one is reached. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. The jury in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial now in deliberations, deciding whether or not Rittenhouse is guilty on the five different charges for the shooting deaths of Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber and also causing injury to Gage Grosskreutz. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek joining us now from Kenosha. So, Andrew, what time did the jury take the case this morning? Yes, yeah, so the jury got the case right around 9.15 or so. That is when the 12 jurors were selected from the panel of 18. And that happened through a random drawing of the jurors' numbers from a bingo-style tumbler. And those numbers of the six who were deemed alternates in this case were hand-selected randomly from that tumbler by Kyle Rittenhouse himself. The judge told those six jurors who were dismissed that they still have to stay in the courtroom, and they were given the same instructions that they've been given through this entire trial. They're not allowed to discuss the case with each other. They're not allowed to watch any sort of coverage of the trial, read anything on the trial, um, and they are being held in the courthouse just in case one of the 12 jurors who are now deciding Kyle Rittenhouse's fate is disqualified for any reason. Judge Schrader said that that is very unlikely, but he can't let those six who were dismissed from actually deliberating this uh, be let go just yet. So we were just watching video of Kyle Rittenhouse actually picking those names, selecting the jurors from the tumbler. Is that normal for defendants in Wisconsin to do this? 
Yeah, Courtney, this was something I, I posted a video of uh, Kyle Rittenhouse choosing those numbers from that Tumblr on my social media, on my Twitter page, and that was a big question that a lot of people are asking, saying, is this normal for Kyle Rittenhouse or a defendant to be selecting the people who won't be sitting on this jury? From the pool reporter who was in the courtroom, um, this is typical for Judge Schrader. Uh, the, uh, the pool reporter said that Wisconsin judges typically have their courtroom clerk choose the six or however many jurors who will be dismissed from the case before the jury starts deliberating, but this is typical uh, for Judge Schrader to have the defendant pick those six who will be dismissed. Um, jury is still deliberating right now. We're not sure if we will get a verdict on this trial today or not, but as soon as we learn anything, Thing, we will be sure to bring that to you, Courtney. Yeah, you are there keeping an eye on everything. Andrew Havranik reporting from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Thank you. Live on Spectrum News 1 and back to Kenosha now, where the wait for a verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial continues right now as jurors spend most of Tuesday weighing their options behind closed doors in a case that has captured the country's attention. Spectrum News 1's Megan Marshall will join us from outside the courthouse momentarily, but Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek begins our coverage now live from the Kenosha County Courthouse inside there. Andrew, what do we know about those deliberations so far? Yeah, Jason, so so far what we know is that the jury has asked two questions of the judge, and both of them dealt with getting more copies of the jury instructions. The first set of questions came this morning. They wanted more copies of the first six pages of those jury instructions that dealt with the self-defense, provocation, and retreat aspects of this case. The second time, they asked for the rest of the instructions. It's 36 pages long. They asked for um, pages 7 through 36 of those instructions dealing with everything else, and that happened just before 3 o'clock. Now, the 12 jurors started deliberations just before 9.30 this morning. They started deliberating after the six alternates were dismissed, um, and those six alternates are still in the courthouse under order, uh, under recommendation to stay in the courthouse from the defense. They have to follow the same rules that they've been following up to this point. They can't discuss the case with anyone, with including each other. They can't read or watch watch any coverage of the case, and they have to stay in the courthouse. There have been rare instances, sometimes in cases you'd recognize by their importance, uh, where jurors have been restored to the jury uh, after having been dismissed. So that is conceivable that would happen in this case. It's not likely, but it's, in fact, it's quite unlikely, but it's possible. Judge Schrader there. Andrew, we saw a video of Kyle Rittenhouse pulling those six numbers of the jurors who were then dismissed. Is that normal? Yes, yeah, so from what we understand, that is normal for Judge Bruce Schrader for trials that he presides over. Um, the pool reporter who has been in the courtroom all day from the Associated Press said typically the judge in Wisconsin will have their um, courtroom clerk pull those uh, numbers out of that tumbler that you saw Rittenhouse pulling those numbers out of. But um, again, it's common for Judge Schrader to have the defendant do that. And it's been a lot of waiting around for everyone today. Do we know where the jury stands right now? Are they still delibor deliberating, rather, or are they set to come back tomorrow? So as of right now, um, we do believe that the jury is still deliberating. The judge told us um, kind of informally around 4 o'clock that he planned to check in with the jurors um, around 5 o'clock tonight. He says uh, he prefers to let the deliberating jurors kind of take the reins in this. He said he'll ask them uh, whether or not they want to continue deliberating tonight or how long they would like to continue tonight um, before potentially going into tomorrow. Again, he said he was going to do that around 5 o'clock. So we should learn here um, in the next few moments on where the jury stands. And of course, those court-ordered rules would remain in effect if they were indeed to go home tonight. We'll keep monitoring everything right there. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek live in Kenosha from inside the courthouse. Andrew, thank you for being with us. The jury in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial has not yet reached a verdict after one full day of deliberations. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek has been covering this trial for us and reports on when jurors will return to the courthouse today. 
The jury will return to the courthouse at 9 o'clock this morning to continue deliberations in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. They've already deliberated for nearly nine hours yesterday. That included a lunch break, but they have not yet come to a verdict. There's no sign on how much longer the jury has to deliberate in this case, but the judge did send them home last night. They are not sequestered, but the six who were dismissed early in the day yesterday will also have to return. They are kept separate from the 12 who are deliberating this case just in case one of those 12 is dismissed or disqualified for any sort of reason. The judge told those six that it is very unlikely that that could happen, but said that it has happened on cases that he has had in his courtroom before. Again, the jury will return to the courthouse at 9 o'clock this morning to continue deliberations. We will be here and we will bring you a verdict as soon as one is made. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. The 12 person jury for the Kyle Rittenhouse trial back in deliberations after nearly nine hours behind closed doors Tuesday. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek joining us from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew, when did those jurors return this morning? Yes, yeah, so those jurors were asked to return at 9 o'clock this morning. I'm in the courtroom uh, today, uh, was waiting for any sort of news on that at 9 o'clock when those jurors were supposed to return. Around 9.20 this morning, the court reporter came over to uh, the journalists who were in the courtroom and said that the jurors had already started deliberating um, and that Judge Schrader has some unrelated hearings um, also this morning. So that's why there was no kind of official welcome back to this morning and then go into jury deliberations. Again, as you said, they were behind closed doors for more than nine hours yesterday. That did include uh, a break for lunch. We don't know how long they took a break for lunch from those deliberations. And they only asked two questions, and both of those questions yesterday dealt with getting 11 more copies of the jury instructions. There's 12 jurors, but they only had one copy of the jury instructions, which is typical for uh, jury trials of this nature. They start off with one, and then they'll ask for more copies so that everybody uh, can have them if they need them. They have not come back to ask questions about seeing more evidence or anything yet. So that is all on the table today. So th these jurors could be uh, still behind closed doors for quite some time today. And there's one thing that's still hanging out there that we heard during the course of the trial, the motion for a mistrial by the defense. It was filed last week. Is Has there been any ruling on that? And will there be? And when? I guess is the biggest question. Yeah, so that is really the big thing still looming over this whole case outside of the verdict, right? Uh, so the judge has that under advisement. He did not rule on that uh, last week. The judge or the defense motion for that mistrial with prejudice, meaning if the judge does accept that motion for a mistrial, the state would not be able to retry this case. Now, if the jury comes back with not guilty verdicts on all of the counts that Kyle Rittenhouse faces with this, that motion for a mistrial is essentially a moot point. Point. However, if the jury comes back with a guilty verdict on any of those counts, the judge would then have to issue a ruling on that motion for a mistrial, which has yet to be seen, Courtney. Yeah, wait and see on all of this. Andrew Havranek at the Kenosha County Courthouse. Thank you, Andrew. Back live on Spectrum News 1 and back to Kenosha now, where after a second full day of deliberations there, the jury in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial has not reached a verdict again. But... The defense has asked for multiple mistrials, including one without prejudice. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek beginning our team coverage out there now. Spectrum News 1's Megan Marshall joining us as well momentarily. All live from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew, why are they asking for that and what would it mean if it's granted? Yeah, so there are two motions for a mistrial here in this case. One that was mentioned last week and then filed on Monday. That is the one with prejudice. If the judge grants that motion for a mistrial, that would mean that the state cannot retry this case against Kyle Rittenhouse. But during some jury questions today that they would send down to the judge to get uh, some evidence uh, so that they could watch some evidence while they're doing some deliberations, the defense also said they would like to file for a motion without prejudice. That means that the state would be able to try this case again if the judge does accept that. And it's all over one key piece of evidence. Kyle Rittenhouse's defense attorney, Corey Shirofficy, knows his client could spend a lot of time behind bars for shooting and killing two people and injuring a third during protests last August. But we're talking about a potential life sentence here. He argues the defense team did not have the highest quality drone video that was used as evidence in this case. 
saying they didn't know until evidence was closed on Friday. I think that is required in a case like this where he's looking at a life sentence potentially without parole if he's convicted. Um, and to not get that until the evidence has already been closed, that doesn't strike me as fair. Prosecutors say they didn't know the version the defense had was any different than what they had. They said there may have been an issue when it was airdropped to them and emailed to the defense. And now all of a sudden, the defense is calling into question uh, technology and not wanting videos in, and it's all to protect their client. And I understand that is their job. I'm not criticizing them for this, but their client lied about this on the stand is the state's position. There seems to be evidence to support the position that he lied on the stand about, not, about raising the gun. He was confronted with the exhibit. He denied it. The jury wants to see these exhibits. They say the motion for a mistrial shouldn't be accepted, saying the jury only saw the highest resolution. That is, that is what matters. That is what the jury sees. That is what they have seen, that they want to see it again. The defense said if it had the highest quality version of the video, it would have changed the way it presented its case. We would have done this case in a little bit different manner if that was the situation. Now the judge has both of those motions for a mistrial under advisement. Something to remember here, if the jury delivers a full acquittal of Kyle Rittenhouse, the judge will not have to issue any sort of rulings on that. Those mistrial motions will be a moot point. However, if there is any sort of guilty verdict on any of the five counts against Kyle Rittenhouse, the judge will have to rule one way or another on those two motions, Jason. Andrew, quickly, what's the latest on the jurors still deliberating there tonight? Yeah, so the uh, jury deliberations are over. We have just kind of approached the 17th hour of deliberations over these past two days. Jurors and those six alternates who have been sequestered away from the 12 who are deliberating this case will return to the courtroom tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. As will you. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranik live there in Kenosha for us tonight. Andrew, thank you for joining us here. As jurors in the Rittenhouse trial enter day three of deliberations, a defense motion for a mistrial continues to loom over the proceedings. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranik filed this report. The 12th person jury deliberated for nearly eight more hours yesterday, but have still not reached a verdict in the case against Kyle Rittenhouse. The Rittenhouse defense asked for another motion for a mistrial, this time without prejudice, meaning if the judge accepts this motion, the state would have a chance to retry this case. The defense says that their issue right now is that they were given a lower quality drone video that was used as evidence in this case than the video that the prosecution had in their possession. The defense says that if they would have had the high quality video, they may have changed how they approached their case. I think that is required in a case like this where he's looking at a life sentence potentially without parole if he's convicted. Um, and to not get that until the evidence has already been closed, that doesn't strike me as fair. Jurors will again return to the courtroom at 9 o'clock this morning. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Haveranek, Spectrum News. Jurors back in deliberations today after spending almost nine hours Monday and eight hours yesterday behind closed doors. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Haveranek inside the Kenosha County Courthouse. So, Andrew, what's happened so far today? Gourney, so far today, it's been pretty quiet. The uh, court official said the jurors got here just at 9 o'clock and went straight to the deliberation room. Um, we have seen Judge Schrader on the bench. He has a full schedule of um, hearings for unrelated cases, uh, very much like yesterday. Um, but so far, it's been a pretty quiet day. And jurors did ask to see several videos yesterday. Break down some of that for us. Yeah, so we haven't heard any questions today, but yesterday they did have questions. Uh, they wanted to see two different sets of videos. The first set of videos um, was from Gage Grosskreutz live stream. Grosskreutz is the man who was injured by Kyle Rittenhouse and shot in the bicep. Um, he was live streaming that night, and the jurors, jurors wanted to see the moment that they first saw each other after the first shooting of Joseph Rosenbaum. Uh, they wanted to see that. They wanted to see the video of the Anthony Huber and Gage Grosskreutz shooting, and and then the seconds after uh, that shooting when Kyle Rittenhouse is walking away. They also wanted to see 
the drone footage in this case. Um, that drone footage is of the first shooting um, of Joseph Rosenbaum. They wanted to see that, and there was um, quite a bit of argument as to uh, that video yesterday, Courtney. Yeah, that drone video has become a hot button issue this week with the attorneys and the judge. The defense actually filed another mistrial because of the drone footage. Yeah, so this the arguments over this drone footage really started last Friday when the attorneys were trying to figure out the last um, juror instructions that the jury was going to receive before they got the case. Um, the judge wanted to see the best picture of all of this. Um, there's a still photo of this drone footage that the prosecution says shows Kyle Rittenhouse lifting his gun at Rosenbaum and the Zeminskis in this case, saying that he provoked everything. The defense says that's not the case, and what the prosecution claims is the gun is actually a mirror on the truck. Well, on Friday, the judge asked to see that video, and the prosecution didn't have their laptop to do that, so the defense brought theirs over and uh, Assistant District Attorney James Krause says this isn't the right, the, we have a more clear video. Um, so then the defense said, we don't have this same clear video that the prosecution has. So that is why they filed this mistrial yesterday, um, saying that if they would have had this high quality video, that they may have approached the defense for Kyle Rittenhouse a little bit differently. So there are two motions for a mistrial that are looming over this case as we still await a verdict here. Again, and as I've reported before, if there's an acquittal for Kyle Rittenhouse on all the charges, the judge doesn't have to rule on any of those motions for a mistrial. But if there is a guilty verdict, he will have to rule one way or another on this. So still a lot to watch for in this case, Courtney. Definitely. And we are in day three of jury deliberations. Andrew Havranik reporting from the Kenosha County Courthouse. And live on Spectrum News 1, back to Kenosha. Three straight days of deliberations now. Still no verdict in the ongoing trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek beginning our team coverage now. Live there from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew, a bit of a quieter day there today than yesterday. Yeah, Jason, the jury didn't have any questions throughout the day. We didn't hear from them until they were getting ready to go home just about an hour ago. One of the jurors asked the judge if she could take a copy of the jury instructions home. The state didn't object. The defense uh, lead defense attorney, Mark Richards, shook his head no, but the judge said yes, as long as notes of their deliberations don't go home as well. But the big thing that happened today is that MSNBC is no longer in allowed inside the courthouse. That decision was made by Judge Bruce Schrader this afternoon. He said Kenosha police pulled over a man last night with, uh, who had run a red light while driving just a block behind the jury bus, which has all of its windows covered and blocked out. The man identified himself as James J. Morrison and said he was with MSNBC. He also told police his supervisor was Irene Bion. Bion's apparent social media, which has been since deleted, shows that she was a booking producer at NBC News. This is a very serious matter, and I don't know what the ultimate truth of it is, but absolutely it, it, it would go without much thinking that someone who is following a, the jury bus, uh, that is a very, ex, it's extremely serious matter, and uh, will be referred to the uh, proper authorities for further action. Thank you. NBC News. NBC News released a statement saying it was a freelancer who was pulled over and that that freelancer never contacted or intended to contact any of the jurors. Police said there were no photos taken and there was no breach of juror security and that person was given a traffic citation, Jason. Andrew, quickly, everyone's looking to kind of read the tea leaves into all of this over the past three days. The jury's had this case for three full days now, still no verdict. What, if anything, does any of this mean? 
Yeah, it's really impossible to read what is happening in a jury room when you are not one of the 12 jurors inside that room. They are the only ones who know what they are discussing and how much longer it's going to take to discuss a case. Now, just to compare this high profile trial to other high profile trials, we're at about 24 hours over three days. It took the jury in Minneapolis about 10 hours to convict Derek Chauvin of killing George Floyd. It took about 10 hours in the Casey Anthony trial, and it took jurors less than four hours to acquit OJ Simpson. So it really could be left up to the jury. And I did a little bit of quick research. The longest deliberations was 55 days for a case in Oakland, California. So really all up in the jury's hands. 55 days, I believe, would take us to the second week of January. Hope you brought some good reading material there to Kenosha. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek joining us live there. Andrew, thank you for being here as always. This morning, jurors in the Cal Rittenhouse trial will return to the courthouse and resume deliberations. They've now had the case for three full days, but still no verdict. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek reports from Kenosha. Jurors have been behind closed doors for nearly 24 hours over the past three days trying to find a verdict in this case. Now, we didn't hear from jurors too much yesterday, pretty much not at all until the very end of the day when they were getting ready to go home. One juror asked the judge if she could take home a copy of the jury instructions. The state didn't object, but defense attorney Mark Richards did shake his head no. Judge Schrader, though, did say that the jury can take home a copy of their instructions as as long as they do not take home any notes about what they've been deliberating about in those closed door deliberations. Now, the jury again will report to the courthouse at nine o'clock to continue their fourth straight day. A jury can have as much time or as little time as they need to decide a case. The Derek Chauvin trial took 10 hours. Casey Anthony also took about 10 hours. O.J. Simpson was acquitted in just four. So there's a lot to still be waiting on. Reporting in Kenosha, Andrew Havranek, Spectrum News. Jurors back in deliberations for a fourth straight day. As of this morning, they've spent more than 20 hours discussing this case. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek at the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew, any signs of anything happening today? Yeah, no signs really just yet on anything so far this morning. I do have a seat up in the courtroom uh, today, and we did not see the jury just as we have the past few days. The jury has been arriving to the courthouse and going straight to the deliberation room, and we do believe that that happened right around 9 o'clock this morning. There is a rumor out there that the jury has declined a lunch order. There was a reporter that asked uh, the court clerk if that rumor is true. That clerk said that she had not heard anything on that yet. But if that rumor is the case, then that could indicate that maybe the jury is getting a little bit closer to reaching a verdict one way or the other. In this case, again, the court clerk said that the, she did not hear anything about juries, the jurors um, declining that lunch order for today. One thing that came up yesterday, the judge allowing a juror to take her copy of jury instructions home last night. She, in fact, did so. Did any other members take theirs home? Do you know? So not sure if any other jurors took their instructions home, but yeah, that came up right as the judge was dismissing uh, the jurors for the evening. Um, one of the jurors asked if she could take her copy of the jury instructions home with her. Uh, the only attorney to kind of express any opinion on this was attorney Mark Richards, the lead defense attorney. He was shaking his head no as that question was being asked, but the judge did allow her to take a copy of the jury instructions home, but said no notes about what had been deliberated on in the jury room were allowed to go home with her. Uh, I, any feeling on how either side is doing right now as far as the attorneys go? I know that um, some of them are getting a little bit fidgety as we go into day four. Yeah, everybody is really on that wait and see game, right? Because, you know, the jury, the only people who know what is happening in that jury deliberation room are those 12 jurors. Um, a lead defense attorney, Mark Richards, walked in. He popped his head into the courtroom yesterday for a brief moment late in the afternoon, and he was asked, you know, how are you feeling? You know, what is there anything going on? He said, no, nothing's going on. I just popped my head in because I'm stressed and bored. So the defense attorneys are feeling the same way that a lot of people are right now. It's just a wait and see kind of game. We have not seen 
attorneys for either side or even seen Kyle Rittenhouse so far today. But as soon as that changes, we'll let you know, Courtney. Yeah, a lot of anticipation for a verdict in this case. Andrew Havrandic reporting from the Kenosha County Courthouse. Thank you, Andrew. We can see him. Hopefully we can hear you. Andrew. Yeah, so I was uh, just came downstairs from the courtroom. Um, a, uh, before the verdict was even reached, there was a lot of emotion from both sides. Kyle Rittenhouse's mom and his sisters, both visibly, uh, all three of them nervous. Um, uh, one of the sisters was out uh, just crying um, before the verdicts were even read. Right behind me sat Anthony Huber's girlfriend, uh, his great aunt, as well as the fiance for Joseph Rosenbaum. They were sitting behind me also nervous. When Kyle Rittenhouse came in just before the jury, you could see that he was nervous there as well, but when the jury read those five not guilty verdicts for the five counts that he faced, um, I know, as you've said, he kind of broke down there and kind of hit the floor, hit the table, um, and then he ended up hugging his defense attorney, Corey Shirafasi. Um, and then uh, behind me, uh, you had um, Hannah Giddings, Anthony Huber's girlfriend, um, and his great aunt crying at that point, just kind of in shock um, over the verdicts that were read uh, today in court. This was jury deliberations that took four days, um, about 26, 27 hours a jury was behind closed doors deliberating in this case. So quite a lot of time to go over all of those five counts. And remember, the last two counts, the counts that dealt with Anthony Huber and Gage Grosskreutz, they were also considering some lesser included charges. Um, and when the judge told Kyle Rittenhouse when those lesser included charges were going to be considered, he said it would potentially no, increase the, like, the likelihood that he could be found guilty on those. Again, not guilty on any of the charges that Rittenhouse faced. Spectrum News One's Andrew Hovranek there. Once again, we can hear Andrew right now. We were hard to see him as uh, the signal continues to cut out as it does outside the Kenosha County Courthouse right now because you have so many members of the local and national media on hand. They're all trying to fight for that same signal. And one of the things that we had noticed too, and if we can get Andrew's audio back at least, I'd love to know because we're watching this play out with you right now. As soon as the verdict was read and the judge had thanked the jury for their service to the to the country and to Kenosha County, as you mentioned, you saw Rittenhouse move from the table over to the right side of the screen, and I'm not entirely sure who he was going over there to chat with or if he was leaving the courtroom. So Andrew was able to see that live there in person in the front row of the courthouse, and I'm curious about whether or not uh, uh, Rittenhouse had made his way to the jury or to someone else there before departing the courtroom and where he goes from here. Do we still have Andrew? I don't, I don't think, think we, we have still... Andrew anymore. All right. Well, that'll, that'll be a question we, we can ask him. We're going to show you another live picture outside the courthouse. It's, we have a limited view right now. We're focused on this door. And Andrew, a question I'd asked a short time ago. Once Kyle Rittenhouse left the spot where he was sitting, the verdict had been read. Where did Kyle Rittenhouse go in that courthouse? Because we weren't able to see from our angle. So he went as soon as the verdict was reached and you saw him kind of hit the table and kind of collapse uh, shaking as he as we saw him shaking when he was giving his testimony last week. Um, he was escorted out the uh, back side door by the uh, judges chambers by a deputy. So that is where he went after he hugged his attorney and the jury had all left um, the courtroom. Jason. Uh, you mentioned the, one of the victim's family and their reaction, Anthony Huber's family uh, in the courtroom. Was Gage Grosskreutz there? He testified he's the one survivor from that night. I, I did not see Gage Grosskreutz in the courtroom. Um, we haven't seen him since his testimony, um, but he was not in the courtroom when the uh, jury was read, at least as far as what I could see. Um, but as I said, um, Anthony Huber's girlfriend and great aunt were sitting right behind me, as well as Carrie on Swart, uh, the fiance of Joseph Rosenbaum, who we also heard testimony from um, when the state was calling witnesses to the stand. Andrew, you spent a lot of time there in Kenosha, obviously, over the last three weeks, predominantly there in the courtroom and in the courthouse, but you've spent time outside as well. And, and we've been live with you at around 5 o'clock each evening, and there have been several dozen people outside of the courthouse. Once we learned, especially this week, that a verdict was not coming down by 5 o'clock, and you had several protesters out there. What kind of transpired afterwards? Did everyone kind of go home after 5 o'clock, or what's kind of played out outside of the courthouse the past few days? 
Well, that test yeah, so the last few days, um, you've noticed that I haven't been doing my live shots inside this room, which is where we've been pretty much for three weeks. The last two days, we were doing those outside, so I had to go through kind of the um, the group of protesters um, on both sides who were standing on the steps. Um, around 5 o'clock on um, Wednesday, they started kind of marching down um, the road just in front of um, just in front of the courthouse, um, and they kind of marched around the courthouse. Um, one had a drum. They've had um, loudspeakers and have just been chanting um, uh, different chants while they've been marching around the courthouse. Uh, yesterday it was a very small kind of assembly in front of the courthouse, so there really wasn't too much going on um, last night at all um, when we were doing our live shots at 5 o'clock. Andrew, stay with us, but I want to talk about the picture that we have up right now. A wider view of the courthouse. You can see the, the group behind those trees gathered by that one entrance. People are exiting. You can see all of the news vehicles there on the left side of your screen. But it doesn't look like a large gathering of people at this point at 12 almost 40 on this Friday uh, in the afternoon. It looks like a very small crowd, a couple of people milling about, a couple of people standing, maybe waiting to see if Kyle Rittenhouse and his defense team comes out to talk after that not guilty verdict is read. Andrew, are people st well, you're, you're down in a room, but were people still milling around the courthouse that you could tell right after? Um, the verdict. So when I left, I left the courtroom just um, before the Rittenhouse family had left the courtroom. And to get out, they have to come down here to the basement of the courthouse. Now, this is what is considered a jury office that was used um, right next to us is where the media workroom has been. It's another jury room. Um, this is where um, if there are any news conferences from the defense team or uh, if any jurors wanted to speak to us, this is where they will be allowed to do that. In the hallway, um, just down to my right a little bit, um, part of that hallway is blocked off, and that is where family and everybody is able to come down. So we are not able to see who is on that side of the hallway when they come down from the courtroom. Um, but I left the courtroom just before um, Wendy Rittenhouse, Kyle Rittenhouse's mom, and his two sisters were out of there. Um, the family for Anthony Huber and uh, Joseph Rosenbaum were out before I was. Andrew, you can also be kind of our eyes and ears over the past few weeks as you were personally there in the courtroom as this trial played out. And the jury, of course, was not allowed to be shown on video. We know that there were seven women and five men that made up the final 12-person jury there. As the trial played out, what were those moments that you can remember where you thought the jury might have been most impacted? Maybe they were taking more notes than others or, you know, talking to themselves as the trial played out. Were there, were there any big moments over the past two weeks that you really felt like that, that might have struck a chord, that might have resonated? I know that they were closely watching all that video. Well, there was a little audible yeah, so that video was a, a, a key part of what the jurors were really taking notes on and very intently watching during all of this. Um, but I really do think a, 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 the key testimony in here where jurors were really maybe emotionally compelled to was Kyle Rittenhouse's testimony himself. He broke down on the stand and kind of had what seemed to be maybe like a panic or an anxiety attack as he was recalling those moments just before he shot Joseph Rosenbaum um, outside the car, car source here in Kenosha last August. Um, they were really taking notes there. They were they were emotionally drawn to uh, to that testimony. But during a lot of testimony, whether it was from Gage Grosskreutz or um, uh, other witnesses in this, they were very adamant on writing notes. But the more we got into some of that technical stuff, and I know we've talked a lot about the drone video and the picture that the prosecution said was a still from that drone video that showed, that they said showed Kyle Rittenhouse raising his gun and provoking the whole incident. Um, when they were talking about the pixels and stuff, the jury wasn't as intently focused on some of that. And that was a lot of that did happen later in the day. Um, so when you're hearing testimony for hours and hours on end, sometimes the jury starts to lose some of their focus. And I think that also did happen when Rittenhouse was on the stand himself when the assistant district attorney Thomas Binger was doing some of his cross-examination. We had just heard a lot of emotional testimony from him. He was on the stand for hours and Prosecutor Binger was continuing that cross-examination 
they may have started to lose some of their focus there, but otherwise they were very intently writing notes, watching these videos, and this is a case. I, I mean, there's so much video in this case. It's not like a lot of other other trials where you may not have video of an entire event happening. Here you had video of of these two shootings, these three shootings, excuse me, um, happening from these protests. And uh, Thomas Binger said during his opening statement that this wasn't a murder mystery that these jurors had to solve. This was, did Kyle Rittenhouse break the law when he shot these three men? And those jurors said, no, he didn't. And they also had a lot of video leading up to the shootings, which both the prosecution and defense broke down frame by frame almost over and over again. But Andrew, some of those images were really disturbing. And I know you talked about jurors and even Rittenhouse himself looking away at some of those moments. Yeah, there were moments that um, it, it, specifically uh, that I can recall that will, you know, that stick out in my mind. And I know we did not air these because they are, they are graphic, but there's video from Richie McGinnis, who was with the Daily Caller, um, who was um, also part of these charges. Um, he, um, uh, Rittenhouse faced charges for endangering uh, Richie McGinnis's safety, um, but again, was found not guilty on that. He was just behind uh, Rittenhouse and Rosenbaum when Rittenhouse shot Joseph Rosenbaum at that car source. Um, some of that video from him him, um, and from Drew Hernandez, who was also on the scene, showed Rosenbaum taking, you know, gasping for air, gasping his last breaths of life um, as he lay in the car source parking lot before he was taken to the hospital by Richie McGinnis and others. Um, also, some other photos that were really kind of um, uh, key and kind of stuck with the jury maybe were some of the um, photos of the autopsies um, of both Anthony Huber and Joseph Rosenbaum. Any time any of that was shown on those screens, and I, I noted several times that Kyle Rittenhouse would look away from the screen. He was not able to look and see some of these uh, some of these photos. Every once in a while, he would glance to see if it was okay to look at the monitor that was on the defense table, but um, he was visibly unable to watch a lot of that video. Andrew, quickly, a final question for you, at least right now. We were able to see Rittenhouse break down as the verdict was read. We weren't able to see his defense team, or at least not the entire defense team. Were you able to see a reaction from his uh, entire team there? It, uh, when you're in the courtroom, it's really hard to, because you want to see so many different reactions, right? You want to see the reaction of Kyle Rittenhouse, the defendant. You want to see the reaction of his, of his legal team, of his family, of the, vac of the victim's family there as well. Um, but as you said, when Rittenhouse kind of fell to the ground and hit the table there and was crying, he did hug um, Corey Shirofficy, one of his defense attorneys. That is kind of the only um, reaction that I've seen. I've not had a chance to yet watch some video back um, yet to see exactly what some of the uh, reactions were, especially for uh, lead defense attorney Mark Richards there. Um, but uh, that was the one interaction that I saw between Rittenhouse and his attorney was when he hugged uh, Corey Shirofficy after the verdict was read. Richards, of course, with a very passionate closing argument there. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek live there in the Kenosha County Courthouse for us. And our live team coverage continues here. Go to Andrew Havranek at the Kenosha County Courthouse. He has a statement from one of the victim's families to share. Andrew? Uh, yes, yeah, so the Huber family released a statement saying, quote, we are heartbroken and angry that Kyle Rittenhouse was acquitted in his criminal trial for the murder of our son, Anthony Huber. There was no judge justice today for Anthony or for Mr. Rittenhouse's other victims, Joseph Rosenbaum and Gage Grosskreutz. We did not attend the trial because we could not bear to sit in the courtroom and repeatedly watch videos of our son's murder and because we have been subject to many hurtful and nasty comments in the past year, but we watched the trial closely, hoping it would bring us closure. That did not happen. Today's verdict means there is no accountability for the person who murdered our son. It sends the unacceptable message that armed civilians can show up in any town incite violence and then use the danger they have created to justify shooting people in the street. They go on to say, make no mistake, our fight holds uh, those responsible for Anthony's death accountable, continues in full force. Neither Mr. Rittenhouse nor the Kenosha police who authorized his bloody rampage will escape justice. Anthony will have his day in court. So a very strong statement there from the family of Anthony Huber, um, the one man who was shot and killed by Kyle Rittenhouse. And that charge that Rittenhouse faced on that, the main charge was, was really one of the 
biggest ones in this whole case. Had he been found guilty on that charge for killing Anthony Huber, he could have seen life in prison. And that was on count four. That was one of those counts where the judge had allowed lesser charges to be considered by the jury there. And I know that a lot of legal analysts at that point felt like, well, if they don't catch him on the strongest one, perhaps one of these lesser charges, and those had carried potential uh, prison times of up to 60 years behind bars. Uh, Andrew, as you're still inside the courthouse at this point right now, we spoke with Megan Marshall a short time ago outside. She had been hearing that Kyle Rittenhouse had already left the building and people were waiting for him to potentially exit a door there. Have you heard anything inside the courthouse right now as far as who might still be inside right now or who has departed? Uh, I have not heard anything inside. There is a window kind of right off to the left of me. There was a lot of movement over there, but that is the main entrance there. I believe if Kyle Rittenhouse would have left the courthouse, he would have went out a back side door. I was speaking with one of the photographers with Ocean Newspaper um, here, and he said that whether or not there was a guilty verdict or not, Rittenhouse probably would have went out a back door here. I don't think he would have went out those main doors. One note, you mentioned this earlier, the we prosecution had said that they sure. will not be doing any interviews post-verdict. The defense never issued such a statement. Did you get any sense from the defense whether or not it would be available to, to talk today or, or once that verdict came in, Andrew? Should the defense attorneys come down to speak? Um, Courtney, I am sorry. I actually am the, uh, the service um, trying to hear what you're asking is kind of breaking up a little bit, so I did not hear your question. Uh, let me try one more time with you, and if you can't hear us, we'll, we'll come back here. But did you get any sense from the defense whether or not they would be open to addressing the media after a verdict comes in? Um, so the defense has not said one way or another if they were going to speak um, with reporters after this verdict. Again, that would be, um, we have a microphone, we have a camera just uh, set up just behind us if that happens. Um, Thomas Binger, the assistant district attorney here in Kenosha County, said earlier this week that he would not be speaking, the district attorney's office would not be speaking um, after this regardless of the verdict. So we definitely will not be hearing from the prosecution, um, at least for what they said earlier this week. All right, Andrew Havranek, live at the Kenosha County Courthouse. Andrew, thank you. State of Wisconsin versus Kyle Rittenhouse. That's the first count of the information, Joseph Rosenbaum. We, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the second count of the information, Richard McGinnis, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the third count of the information, unknown male, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fourth count of the information, Anthony Huber, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Ritt Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. The moment we had waited days for there, Friday after three straight days of deliberations and a few more hours, the judge in Kenosha suddenly had everyone back into the courtroom just after noon on Friday as the jury delivered that verdict of not guilty across the board. Rittenhouse had pleaded self-defense after shooting and killing Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber and shooting and injuring Gage Grosskreutz during that unrest in Kenosha back in August of 2020. Rittenhouse was facing homicide charges in the deaths of Rosenbaum and Huber and attempted homicide charges for shooting Grosskreutz. Homicide charges alone carry the potential for a sentence of life in prison. Now the 18-year-old is free and because of double jeopardy can't be charged again in criminal court. And live here on Spectrum News 1, we have comprehensive team coverage for you tonight. Spectrum News 1's Megan Marshall outside the Kenosha County Courthouse all week long, along with today, and she'll have reaction from community members there. But we begin with Spectrum News 1's Andrew Havranek, who's been inside the courthouse since the trial began, covering the proceedings since the trial started nearly three weeks ago. And Andrew, you were in the courtroom as that verdict was read today. What was the feeling in that room just before it came down? Yeah, just before jurors entered the courtroom to announce their verdict, Kyle Rittenhouse sat at the defense table, visibly nervous and anxious. Just three rows behind him sat his mom and two sisters who were all crying. But that'll change just minutes later. As the court clerk read the verdict. We the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Ritt Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Kyle Rittenhouse collapsed to the ground, shaking as he hugged defense attorney Corey Sharofasi, one of two lawyers who convinced the jury Rittenhouse acted in self-defense on August 25th, 2020. He wishes none of this would have ever happened. 
but as he said when he testified, he did not start this. That's lead defense attorney Mark Richards. He spoke with reporters outside of his office shortly after the verdict was reached. Kyle is not here. He's on his way home. He wants to get on with his life. Um, he has a huge sense of relief for what the jury did to him today. While the verdict was read, Anthony Huber's girlfriend and great aunt were seated behind me in the courtroom, along with Joseph Rosenbaum's fiance, Carrie Ann Swart, all three stunned by the acquittal. The Huber family released a statement saying in part, quote, we are heartbroken and angry that Kyle Rittenhouse was acquitted in his criminal trial for the murder of our son, Anthony Huber. There was no justice for Anthony or for Mr. Rittenhouse's other victims, Joseph Rosenbaum and Gage Grosskreutz, end quote. They go on to say, quote, make no mistake, our fight to hold those responsible for Anthony's death accountable continues in full force. You know, I wish nobody died. I wish I never met Kyle Rittenhouse. And I don't mean that because he was a bad client. I just mean because then this wouldn't have happened. The jury deliberated for nearly 27 hours over four days, but they only asked to see video evidence one time. They wanted to see the video from Grosskreutz's live stream when he questioned Rittenhouse after the fatal shooting of Rosenbaum. They also wanted to see drone video, which was a hotly contested piece of evidence between the state and defense. Richards was asked about that. He said he's glad he doesn't have to argue about it in court. He was also asked about the decision to put Rittenhouse himself on the stand. You want the truth? Yeah. Had to put him on. It wasn't a close call. Um, at certain points, we wondered whether we would put him on. In Wisconsin, if you don't put a client on the stand, you're going to lose. Period. Prosecutors Thomas Binger and James Krause did not hold a news conference. Neither did any of the jurors. However, District Attorney Michael Gravely released a statement saying, quote, We respect the jury verdict based on three and a half days of careful deliberations. Certainly, issues regarding the privilege of self-defense remain highly contentious in our current times. We ask that all members of the public accept the verdicts peacefully and not resort to violence. Mark Richards said he does not believe that Kyle Rittenhouse will stay living in the area. He says Rittenhouse suffers from PTSD after the incident and has been seeing a therapist for that, saying he also cannot sleep at night. But we do know he is home tonight, Jason. Andrew, quickly, those jurors were there at the courthouse for 15 days, nearly four spent in deliberation. What was their mood like when they finally reached that verdict? Yeah, some you looked at and they looked exhausted. I mean, spending about 27 hours, as you said, in deliberations takes a lot, um, a lot of work. And some of them even kind of had their uh, faces, th their chins in their hands, and some were fidgeting quite a bit. So it definitely goes to show you that this jury really took a lot of time to get to this verdict. Spectrum News 1's Andrew Hovranek, they're live for us outside the courthouse. Andrew, thank you for joining us here.